Gentlemen, please welcome CEO of the Foundation for Liberty and American Greatness, Nick Adams. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nick Adams and it is my honour to speak for the third year running at this conference, the nation's premier pro-faith and pro-freedom event. I'm a proud American citizen and through the grace of God, I have become the embodiment of the American dream. I'm also a straight, white, Christian male. The last time I checked, I'm told that these things are rather fluid for some these days. Ladies and gentlemen, this morning, in the few minutes that I have, I want to speak about something that nobody wants to talk about, men and masculinity. Men uh, men are the most isolated, persecuted and maligned demographic in the world. And masculinity is the most suppressed, hated and attacked ideology in our culture. The left tells us every single day that masculinity is toxic, but nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, it is the absence of masculinity that is toxic. Every single problem in America today can be traced back to the absence of strength, strength that can come only from real men, genuine masculinity and an alpha male mindset. Think about it. Discipline in schools, teenage pregnancies, gender dysphoria, political correctness, wokeness, everybody gets a trophy, safe spaces, Young employees refusing to get on the phone and make a phone call. Young men traipsing around in public with their pants halfway down their backside. All of it. Does anybody seriously believe that if men were still the stewards of our culture, that any of this would be as commonplace and as prominent as it is in 2023? Does anyone really think that there would be drag queens reading to our children in public libraries and that the use of personal pronouns would be as accepted and ubiquitous as it is if real men still had a significant and substantial influence in the culture. Ladies and gentlemen, more than 25 million children in the United States of America grow up in a home without their biological father. What a disgrace. Studies show again and again and again that children that grow up without a father are infinitely more likely to commit a crime, to live in poverty or to spend time in jail. Modern woke feminism is one of the most destructive forces imaginable and it has decimated the family. It has eliminated unity and it has villainized over 50% of the population. It has created angry women and feminine men. This isn't good for the culture. This isn't good for the country. This isn't good for the world. And it sure isn't any good for women. We know and we have all heard the arguments. Men have all the power. Men have all the privileges. Masculinity is the problem. Men are the issue. Men just need to stop thrusting. The patriarchy has been holding women down since the beginning of time. It's time for revenge. It's time for men to sit in the back seat. It's time for young men today to atone for the sins of the past. It's unfair, it's wrong. But most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, there are extraordinarily dangerous and destructive consequences in telling the male half of the population to curtail their ambitions, to watch their toxic masculinity and to shelve their dreams. The United States of America will rue the day that we went down this path. How can we expect 
to compete with China in the coming decades, scientifically, economically, culturally or militarily, without strong, determined men? Is that when we send in the modern woke feminists and their beta male counterparts to deal with bad actors all around the world? This is the reality that we are faced with today. Only one side of the gender equation is ever discussed. The other side is not even acknowledged. I run a national organisation that teaches young Americans about the greatness of America, about the founding of their country in a bid to secure the American dream for another 200 years at least. Through the course of that work, I interact with young men every single day. I have over 3 million followers on social media, most of which are young men. And I can tell you, they are suffering. They are suffering. They are dropping out of high schools at record rates. They are applying for college at record lows. They aren't getting married. They're flocking overseas in search of love, having given up on the American dating pool. They're intimidated by women. They don't know how to communicate to women. That is the reality. That is the truth. And that is why we as men and women dedicated to family, propelled by faith, we need to take a stand. And I haven't even mentioned the myriad of human rights issues that either uniquely or disproportionately affect men. Suicide, workplace deaths, child custody, homelessness, life expectancy, criminal court bias, sentencing disparity, veterans issues, war deaths, false rape allegations. There are a myriad of those things and we need to take a stand. All of us have brothers, uncles, husbands, fathers, grandfathers, nephews. It is time for alpha males to return. And it is time for modern woke feminists to get in the back seat because that is what the future of this country necessitates. That is what the greatness of this country necessitates. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. God bless you. God bless the 45th and soon to be 47th President of the United States, the greatest president we've ever had, Donald J. Trump. And God bless the pinnacle nation on this earth, the United States of America. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the host of The Benny Show, Benny Johnson. Hey, there's my boys. I heard my boys. I'm actually having my first boy. I got three kids. My boy comes in September. Let's go, more parents. That's how we save the country. We can outbreed them. You ever met a lib? Nobody's having babies with them, man. Yikes. Bad hair, bad teeth. Good morning. Good morning. Am I allowed to say that at a Christian conference? I don't know. Thank you. I'm back in D.C. I lived here for 15 years. I haven't been back. I told my wife I would only go back if I was speaking to a bunch of evangelical Christians and faith people who could pray over me, okay, and could protect me. And so thank you. Thank you. It's an evil place. You feel that dark energy here in this city? Do you feel that? Like over your shoulder? Like Joe Biden going in for a sniff? <laughs> it's bad, man. It's bad. We got actually like an evil, like you actually got like an evil place here in this hotel. You know that Ronald Reagan was shot like right around the corner here, right? A guy named John Hinckley Jr. You know what John Hinckley Jr. is doing right now? John Hinckley Jr. is living out his retirement as a free man in Virginia, making music. So the guy who shot the president, Reagan, is free, and they want to put Donald Trump in jail for 431 years. <laughs> 
431 years. It was 431 years ago that Joe Biden made his first dirty deal in Ukraine. If Joe Biden's last name was Trump, he'd be in Guantanamo Bay right now. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the same room that they hold the White House Correspondents' Dinner in. Do you know this? The press corps is not interested in truth. The media is not interested in truth. There's a lot of evil that goes on in this city. And so I commend you for having a conference called the Faith and Freedom Conference, because there's not a lot of it going around in Washington, D.C. In fact, my entire family was chased out of here when uh, they defunded their police. And then uh, gangbangers burned down my house in a drug war. My little child was inside. My infant child was inside as my house got burned down. There's evil energy here. So I am, um, I believe in exorcism. Do you? Do you believe in that demons exist? Have you ever watched The View? Demons totally exist, okay? Who wants to join me in an exorcism this morning? Who wants to exorcise a little bit of evil out of this place? This place. Joe Biden was just standing right here. White House Correspondents' Dinner, baby. How do we exorcise evil? We speak truth. We speak truth to evil. That is how we exercise it. That's how Christ did it. That's how Jesus did it. Satan brought Jesus up to a high mountain, and what did he show him? All the kingdoms of the world, right? And what did Jesus say? Did Jesus say, you're lying to me? Did Jesus say, no, you can't do that? You can't give me all the kingdoms of the world? No, because Satan actually could, because we live in a sunken place. Christ said, get away from me, Satan. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone you shall serve. Christ spoke truth. And that is how he rebuked Satan, even though Satan was offering him D.C. for all we know, right? Probably. Actually, that was probably the first city on the list. Joe Biden was also around to remember that one, too. So let's speak some truth this morning. I only got a minute left. How much truth can we get into one minute? Shall we go? All right, let's go, baby. How much truth? Let's do an exorcism together, all right? Give me a hallelujah if you believe in this truth. Ready? Go. God is real. Truth number one. There are two genders. Public school teachers do not get to pick your kid's gender. Public school teachers or any adult who sexualizes children inappropriately should go to prison. There are seven billion people in the world and every single one of them was born of a woman. Yeah. A woman is an adult human female. Abortion is murder. Mm -hmm. Children are a gift from God, and real women and real men protect children, defend their children. The government's sole responsibility should be human flourishing. We should give tax incentives to make more families, to stay together as a husband and wife, and to raise children. The family is the greatest weapon known to mankind against tyranny, and that is why they are trying to destroy it. My mom's here. Did you know that? Thanks, Mom. I love you. Ladies and gentlemen, there should be an immediate special counsel in turn to investigate Joe Biden and his crimes. Merrick Garland should be impeached immediately for his obstruction of justice. COVID was created by Dr. Fauci in a lab, and he should also be in prison. <laughs> Melania Trump was the most beautiful first lady we've ever had. <laughs> Just throw it in there. Just throw it in there. My wife's watching at home. She's like, you're right, you're right. I mean, yeah. The U.S. Constitution is the greatest guarantor of freedoms in existence to mankind, this side of the Bible of which it is based upon. Where do you think they get all men are created equal? The scriptures. Ladies and gentlemen, the Constitution is only a piece of paper, unfortunately. It needs moral men and moral women to uphold it. And so that is why I'm honored to be here with you. Even in a place like D.C., even in the worst cities in world history, what did God say? God made a bargain. He said, give me one good man. 
show me one good man or woman. Show me one good one and I'll save the city. Are you going to be that good man or that good woman? Are you going to stand here? Are we going to save this country? We can make that same bargain and we can say, God, you're not done with us yet because we will stand in the gap. We will be the good man. We will be the good woman and we will save this nation. God will create more flourishing for this country and he will heal our land. The best days, ladies and gentlemen, are ours. We march to victory together. God bless you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome business owner and candidate for governor of West Virginia, Chris Miller. Where are, where are my West Virginia people at? Where are they? They're here fantastic. Hello. My name is Chris Miller, and I'm running for the governor of the great state of West by God, Virginia. I was born in West Virginia. I was raised in West Virginia. And will be buried right in West by God, Virginia. When I was 10 years old, I told my dad I wanted a pair of Air Jordan tennis shoes. When he found out they cost $125, he told me to get a job. He told me the truth. Now, I'm 44 years old and I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a husband and father. I'm a leader in my business and community. I'm a boxer and I'm a bison farmer. And I'm here to tell you guys what we in West Virginia know to be the truth. My three children belong to me and my wife. They are not property of the school board. They are not Joe Biden's, and they do not belong to the government. You don't get a trophy just for showing up. The Pledge of Allegiance should be said in schools every day. Biological men don't belong in women's sports. Strong law enforcement makes safe communities. Hard work is undefeated. Printing money just makes a gallon of gas and a gallon of milk more expensive. It is not an economic recovery. Woke is broke. America is still the greatest country on earth. This is a true story. When your Tesla breaks down in West Virginia, coal miners will come and push it to the nearest coal power generator to charge it. That's the truth, look it up. Look, I like problem solving and I'm not a politician. And I know, like me, West Virginians are tired of the same old politicians. All of them are the same person. They've made a career inside of the bureaucracy and they never signed the back of a paycheck. They've never created jobs. They just take your money through taxes and give it back to special interest. And career politicians, they're bad negotiators. They make bad deals for all of us. If I ran my businesses and farm like the government did, I'd be broke. In West Virginia, we call it the good old boy system. And even worse, the good old boy system has led to running our educated young people out of our state. West Virginia, just like the rest of the country, is facing some serious problems. These problems are not made for politicians to solve. They are made for leaders and entrepreneurs to solve. People with real world complexity and real world experiences. People who put their money where their mouth is. And I'm the only person running for governor of my state who has put my money where my mouth is and invested in West Virginia. We provide jobs. I want to keep my children in the state of West Virginia. I want my neighbor's children to stay in West Virginia. And I'm going to create an economy so strong that every single person in this room will want to move to West Virginia. <laughs> Economic growth and an abundance of well-paying jobs means more than just a paycheck to a mountaineer. A job means not only providing for your family financially, but emotionally and spiritually as well. It means teaching the value of hard work and the merit to your kids. 
More jobs means families staying together because young people have opportunities to stay at home and don't have to leave our great state to find them. Jobs represent hope and motivation that can pull all people out of addiction. A strong economy means our schools and educators have the resources they need to make an impact, nourish the minds of our most precious assets, which are our young women and children. Strong leadership and economic development means West Virginia families are afforded the opportunity to live their lives on their terms, not on the government's. You know, in this crazy world we are in, West Virginia has what people want. We believe in the Second Amendment, so Antifa riding doesn't happen. We are safe. We have a low cost of living, and we have a high quality of life. We have beautiful hills and trees and rivers and streams. We are drawn to the land and embrace nature. We have family farms, wildlife, outdoor recreation, and the best hunters on planet Earth. We also have an abundance of clean water, coal, natural gas, and the ability to produce an incredible amount of energy. Guess what? Y'all are going to need it. If we play our cards right, we can do something amazing here. We can make West Virginia the state in the union that has the cheapest power in the country for our people. And we can turn West Virginia into the battery of the East Coast. Isn't that the point of government, to make the lives of people better? Imagine the impact in people's lives when we start cutting the cost of power and cutting people's power bills in half. That's what I call making a difference. That's what I call greatness. Our history is already full of greatness that most people don't realize. They make fun of us for being hillbillies. But among our hills are honest, hardworking people already capable of greatness. We mine the coal that built the steel that led to a victory in World War I. We mine the coal that built the steel that led to a victory in World War II. And we mine the coal that led to the cheap energy and the greatest capitalistic expansion in human history. We did that. We're the state in the union where there are more veterans per capita than any other state. We also have more decorated soldiers per capita than any other state in the country. Heck, almost 10% of our state's population are currently veterans, are currently serving in the United States military. We also produced the hidden figures that put our country on the moon. This is who West Virginia has always been. Fighters, workers, thinkers, and builders. People of faith who fight for freedom. Now imagine if we actually had leaders that could harness the greatness and use it to run state government more like a business. To audit every dime spent by government and literally drive down the cost of government drive down taxes. I'm no politician. A lot like President Trump, I have to go up against the good old boy system and all of these familiar names that have been in government for way too long. I'm not running for governor because I need a job. I've already got plenty of those. I'm running because I feel a sense of duty to the people of my state who have supported my family for over 80 years. Right now is not a time for more politicians and bureaucrats. Right now is a time for real leaders who understand how to make things happen. I believe in West Virginia. I believe in what we are capable of. And if elected governor, I will be West Virginia's greatest promoter we've ever seen. And we will focus on job creation, economic growth, and we will provide an economy that keeps our sons and our daughters home. At the end of the day, Everyone has a seat next to me in church on Sunday, even those I disagree with. I want every West Virginian to feel loved, productive, and appreciated. I want us to thrive together as we redefine the state and address the challenges that an entrepreneur like me has the exact skills to overcome. My name is Chris Miller, and I'm running for governor of the great state of West Virginia. Thank you guys so much for having me. My passion will be saving our families through faith and freedom. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Please welcome the National Director of Priests for Life, Frank Pavone. Good morning, friends. I want to thank Ralph Reed and his team for having me here once again. I have devoted my whole ministry and life to saving unborn children from abortion. As director of Priests for Life, also known as endabortion.us, we are privileged today to be celebrating one year since that disastrous Roe v. Wade decision was wiped off the judicial landscape of America. You know, you can't have freedom or education or health care or security or anything else if your life is ended before you're born. Every right depends on the right to life itself. Nothing takes more human life in our country or in our world than abortion. And we are faced with a Democrat party that is extreme on every issue, including on this one. They want no limit, no restriction whatsoever. They are unapologetic about the so-called right to kill babies, even of healthy mothers carrying healthy babies in the seventh, eighth, and ninth months of pregnancy. And we are committed to continue to expose that extremism as we go into these elections. Brothers and sisters, let me make a connection for you between what's been going on with abortion and what's going on now with transgender. Maybe we've reached a point today in America where we can't say a man is a man or a woman is a woman. Maybe because for 50 years we've been saying a baby's not a baby. What kind of lie? Did Roe v. Wade tell us when they couldn't even define a human life? Maybe we have a Supreme Court justice who can't define what a woman is because the Supreme Court itself hasn't even been able to define what a human being is. And this must end now. This is no longer simply a battle between policies. There used to be a time when we embraced common values in America and we disagreed on policies about how to implement those values. Now every American has to realize this is a battle between us who hold these values and people who say these values don't even exist. People who say truth doesn't exist and freedom isn't even worth defending. These are tyrants, these are Marxists, and they must be stopped. And that's why the church cannot be neutral. When the church stands up and looks at the Biden administration and sees tyranny and looks at the Democrat party and sees people trying to indoctrinate our children and mutilate our children and destroy our border and crush our religious freedom and deny the right to life, when the church names that evil, when the church names the Democrat party as responsible for that evil, that is not the church being political, that is the church being the church. Now we have to be able to name evil wherever we find it, and we're not saying that we're going to be silent about rhinos in the Republican Party who likewise embrace evil. What I'm saying is this. We don't stand on a Republican platform. We don't stand on the Democrat platform. We stand on the platform of Jesus Christ. But we... If we stand on the platform of Jesus Christ, we need to be able to name and call out by name those that are denying that gospel and those who are attacking that faith. Yes. Now, I've been doing that. I've been doing that for years. And as a result, you know, last year I was at this conference and I was dressed a little differently. I was wearing the collar of a Roman Catholic priest and I was called Father. And since then... Because I've been so outspoken on these very things, some of the hierarchy of the Catholic Church decided to convince Pope Francis to kick me out of the priesthood. There is a cancel culture in America. There is a weaponization of government in America. And I'm telling you here today, there is a weaponization also of the government of the church, and it must be opposed. If there, 
If there are people in this government who think that they're going to silence you by threatening you with the loss of their employment, they are wrong. You will not be silenced. If there are people in the church who think they're going to silence me by kicking me out of the priesthood, well, guess what? I have not stopped speaking and will not stop. So thank you. Please connect. Please connect with me in my ministry at endabortion.us. God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the panel for Sowing and Reaping, Voter Registration in 2024. Faith and Freedom Coalition Director of Voter Education, John Harbison. Faith and Freedom Deputy Director of Voter Education, Adam Pipkin. Faith and Freedom Hispanic Division Director, Nilsa Alvarez. And Executive Director of California Faith and Freedom Coalition, Chad Schnitger. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. I'm excited about today. I hope you are too. So yesterday was a great day. Tonight's going to be great. Real quick, I want to take a moment of privilege, and I want to thank all of our canvassers that are here. I know we have dozens and probably hundreds of canvassers here that helped us in the 22 cycle. So thank you so much. As the Director of Voter Education, you, you make our job easier because the way you work for us and you're always willing to just engage and go out and knock doors. So thank you so much for what you do. One important part of what we do in voter education is also voter registration. And Faith and Freedom has been registering voters across the country for years, but leading into the 24 cycle, we have developed a new program where we are really turning up the intensity and really laser focusing on church going families and young adults and encouraging them doing everything we can to get them registered to vote. The church component of this, of this new program is even gonna have grants and different ministry aids where we can have Sunday school curriculum, pastor notes and briefings, sermon notes, where we're encouraging uh, pastors, Sunday school teachers you know, we, we want to be salt and light, so we want to be salt and light in our church and in our community, and voter registration is the first step uh, into that process. Thank you. So we're going to, <laughs> uh, to do this on the church network. We're going to be using our existing networks. We're going to be using our existing teams. Our, if you're a canvasser for us, get ready, because instead of just doing door hangers and voter education doors, we're also going to be doing voter registration at the door where it's legal in states. Um, the other parts of this program, NILSA is a minority outreach that we're doing with churches. So let's talk about that and how that works exactly. Absolutely. I'm excited because for in recent years, what God has been doing is uniting churches, ministries, organizations of every kind that are faith-based and understand the importance of voter registration to get out there, be active in voter registration and not only contribute to higher voter impact goals that we have, but they give all the credit and we give all the credit to Jesus. There is no organization that's gonna take all the credit for what you do in the field. And we like to honor every um, association, pastors network, and uh, organization that is part of that. And I want to uh, please ask, I want to ask to please stand up um, those who are part of La Asociación de Ministros eh, Hispanos del Sur de la Florida, Nación de Fe, HIP, NAPA, Bienvenido Faith Assembly, Hispanos del Sur, Latinos for Tennessee, Faith Thank and Freedom you. Hispanic Florida and Georgia teams, 
Revival Fire Network from New York. Please stand up. Estamos Unidos. And everyone from African American Voices that led in voter registration, please stand up. Thanks to all of these organizations united. We were able to register 27,543 majority minority Christians in 2022. Outstanding. That's all you, and that is Jesus using the body. And thank you for listening to his voice and heeding the call to action. Wow, that's great. I mean, it's just amazing work that we're in that area. And I know we're just continuing to expand and the Lord's opening doors for us. Adam, you and I are political guys. We're, we're data guys. Let's talk about one thing that a lot of people forget about is new movers and what, how that works. Sure, so how that works in, in a practical sense is we take um, the, uh, when you change your address, we take the U.S. Postal National Change of Address. There's, they, they update it all the time. So we take that in real time and we overlay that with our FFC, so we pair it with, with an individual voter that is one of our FFC targeted voters. And so what happens is, let's say somebody moves from Tennessee to North Carolina. Well, that will hit the change of address. And we know a lot about that voter. Um, what, where it's also key is if somebody moves from Charlotte to the western part of North Carolina into the mountains. Um, it's important to do this every year, but it's extremely important to do this during election year. Most states have 20, 45 day windows um, that you have to be registered by. So usually it's about the 1st of October. Um, so a lot of these folks, <clears throat> they move, their intention is to update their voter registration, but let's say they move in August of an election year. They move from Charlotte to the mountains of North Carolina and they just, life gets busy for them, right? <clears throat> and they don't, they don't think to update their voter registration really quick. They think, oh, I'll get to it. Then it becomes the middle of October um, and and they think, well, I'll go back and get my absentee or I'll drive into Charlotte and vote. And a lot of times that just doesn't happen. Um, and this is a very big file. I mean, it, it, for a state like Georgia, you may be looking at 25,000 people on the new movers list that would hit our, kind of hit our database. And so where, what we do is we'll call them, um, uh, mail them, and then home visits. And in a lot of states now, because of uh, new technology, when we send them a text, they will literally be able to change their voter registration online. So it's a really key component of this. Yeah. So, so if you're in a state and you want to do this, contact your state director. And if you don't have a state director, please contact John or Adam or myself at the office um, and we'll kind of help do this. We'll run the, run, run the data for you and we'll be able to break it down to your county specific. Um, and this is a great way. We already know who these voters are. Many times they're really active voters. And so we know they're going to go vote. We just got to get them registered to vote where they live. Mm -hmm. That's great. It's, it's such an important part because every year when we do voter education, we run that list. But now we can run it monthly and track these new and register these new voters and make sure they update. All right, Chad, let's get controversial for a minute. Uh, um, so Chad is... Executive Director of California FFC. Yeah. <laughs> Bless your heart. In, in California, I'm going to say a word that used to scare us to death here. Yeah. You can ballot harvest. I live in Alabama. It's a felony there. <laughs> in, in California, it's not. Faith and Freedom has been doing this in California. Yeah. So talk to us about this experience and how, because I mean, I pulled the data this month, to, uh, this week, 24 states allow some type of harvesting. Yeah. 14 have another sort of simplified harvesting program where you designate, and then 11 just say, we don't care who touches your ballot. Yeah. So how do you do it in California? Well, this may not come as a surprise, but California is the belly of the beast, <laughs> all right? Some of the worst stuff that you guys see out here on the East Coast, I'm sorry, it started my, my neck of the woods. That being said, um, we don't even call it ballot harvesting, uh, the program that we do. These are our Christian ballot prayer drives. And we found a way to do this ethically, uh, legally, in a way that we we feel is up to the standards of, of an organization like the Faith and Freedom Coalition. And it's not easy, but Faith and Freedom, we do hard things. That's right. And one of those things that we do do, and how we accomplish this, is we, we gather collections of churches 
that are willing to have their, pa their pastors lead the congregations in a prayer drive. So they, they tell them way in advance, all right, parishioners, bring in all your ballots because everybody in California gets a ballot now. Bring in your ballots on the last Sunday before the election. And all I'm gonna ask you to do, we don't care how you vote, who you vote, we assume they're probably going to vote for. We're not gonna talk about political parties or candidates or even these controversial issues that Christians should care about. All right, we're not asking anyone to violate their 501c3 status. All we're asking you to do is to participate. So the, the uh, churchgoers bring their ballots in the last day before the election and the pastor will either lay hands on the ballots or on a secure storage box that we provide and, and lead the, the parishioners in a prayer for the candidates, for the election, for elected officials, and for God's will be done in the United States. And, and I feel good with that. And that is a way for us to counter some of the attacks we see on the left. You know, California, we got shut down about as hard as you could. Churches were shut down, churches were fine, nurseries were closed. Um, and, and as I said, we are the belly of the beast. The churches do need to fight back in California. We need to express the fact that we have an active congregation. And I think California has gone as far as they have so far because the church hasn't flexed that muscle. And sure. so we encourage you guys, if you know churches in California or if you know parishioners, tell their pastors to, uh, to participate in this program. Get in contact with me. We provide the church secure storage boxes, training, uh, legal uh, opinions, everything they possibly could need to do these ethically, legally, and, and, and fairly easily. Um, and uh, we're proud of the program we put together. I think it's a model for the rest of the state, and I hope it doesn't come your way. But if it does, we're ready. Good deal, that's great. So just to sort of wrap this whole thing up here, if you are interested in helping us register voters for the 2024 cycle, we've got to start now. We're starting in July. You can't wait and start this in September of 24. It has to be going on now. So if you are interested, if you're a pastor here and your, your church would be interested, reach out to your, your state chapter leader, your FFC state chapter leader or county chapter leader if you have a county chapter. If not, see us, one of us here at the conference or you can email or call us at the office and we'll get you fixed up and on the list as we build out and, uh, and go forward with this thing. Because I mean, it's gonna be huge. We have to go in and, I mean, the numbers are all over the place about how many unregistered church attendees are out there. It's really hard data to track, but we know there are substantial numbers between new movers and, and you know, youth groups turning 18 and college groups. We can go in and really plant inroads in these churches with this new focused program and dealing with, uh, with young families in there as well. So thank you so much for the panel. Thank you, everyone. Have a great conference. <laughs>
uh, human beings who came up to me and, and hugs and, and saying, thank you, thank you for being in the fight. And I always respond, no, thank you for being in the fight. The fact that we're all here together means that we care so much for our country and, and really for our future generations. So I'm thrilled to be here. Not exactly thrilled to be in Washington, D.C. again, but hey, what's happening in this room is so powerful because we have the power of God in this room. When the people possess the power of God, anything is possible. And, and I kind of feel like, not kind of, I know that's what went wrong with Washington. They shoved God out. When they shoved God out, evil crept in. And that's why what is happening in Washington right now on many levels is downright evil. And we need some good, God-fearing people to turn this around. Who's in it? Who's ready? So I, I could sit up here and talk about the corruption in DC. And, and we, you know, I only have eight minutes left. It would take all of that time and then probably two or three more days. So I want to talk about how we turn this around. I want to talk about the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit in this room and how we can turn this around. Are you with me on that, that you're willing to work hard? Because they created a mess, the political elite, and they're forcing us to live in this mess. They sold out the jobs to China, and that really helped to decimate the family. When dad loses a job, things get pretty rough in the family. And that was the beginning decades ago of decimating the family, decimating our economy, and selling out our families, frankly. But what I think we learned when a brash, bold New Yorker came on the scene was that uh, there's a lot more corruption than we thought. I think you all know who I'm talking about. How many of you missed that bull in a China shop? I missed the mean tweets and all. I'll tell you what, we need a bull in a China shop because I kind of feel like the White House has become a China shop. That's right, it's owned by China, and our president is sitting there taking bribes by China. That's not the kind of guy we want representing us. And so I'm looking forward to the next one year and four months to try to turn this around and make sure we get that brash New Yorker back in the White House to help clean things up. It's funny, I, I, uh, I heard that, that there was actually a Republican here criticizing Donald Trump yesterday. My, um, my, my team sent me a video of Chris Christie criticizing President Trump, like he's the problem. Actually, I think he's the answer to turning things around. He's the answer. You cannot blame President Trump, there's no way. Who you can blame are these people who become part of the swamp, the uniparty, and I hate to say it, but there's some people with R's behind their name who are just as guilty as the left for what they've done. They've sat, they've done nothing, they didn't work for we the people, they worked to line their pockets. We need people in Washington who can't be bought, who can't be bribed, who can't be sold. We need real people. We need the Ronald Reagans of the world. We need the President Trumps of the world. We need the mama bears, the papa bears, and the citizen politicians. So let's all step forward and help turn this around. You know, I left my job in the news media because I just couldn't take it anymore. I realized it had become propaganda. And I stepped away from a very you know, wonderful career, 30 years in broadcast journalism as one of the fair ones, but I couldn't stand giving half-truths anymore to the people. And I stepped away from a very big paycheck, uh, a you know, seven-figure contract. My husband supported me in doing that. And I prayed to God, please make sure I don't regret this. And he gave me a sign. I opened up the Bible right as I was praying that. I just put my finger down and I landed on 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 7. You bring nothing into this world and you take nothing out. And that was the sign I needed. I knew I was making the right decision. And I tell you that because I really thought that my whole life was kind of collapsing and closing down and that I would just kind of fall back into the, back, the background. And I was okay with that because I didn't want to do a job that was immoral. But what God had planned for me was so much bigger than anything I could have planned that he put me into this wild political world at a time when we need fighters, at a time when we need honest people, and gave me a whole new, I closed one book and he opened up a whole new book and this one is much more exciting. Even though it's scary out there, even though we're in dark times, it is interesting to know that God put each one of us here. Now, not, maybe not all of you will run for office. There might be some mama bears out there that say, I don't have time to run for office, I'm raising my kiddos. 
but we can do something. God gave us, every one of us, skills, unique skills that are unique to each of us. And right now is the time to tap into those skills and take advantage of God placing us here at this critical moment. How many of you think this is a critical moment in American history? All right. How many of you think this is a critical moment in human history? And that God, that God placed us here for this moment is something that is so phenomenal. So when you're getting down and you say, this hill is, is too, too tough, it's too big, I can't climb it, I don't have the energy, I don't have the power, just remember, God thinks so highly of you that he placed you here at this time in history. And that means we can all do something. It might not be, it might not be you're running for office. Maybe you just step up as a mom and you say, I'm going to the uh, school board meetings and I'm gonna get loud. Maybe you use your voice on social media and risk being canceled. We can all do something. How many of you have heard the, the phrase, and I think it was um, Reverend Billy Graham, courage is contagious. It truly is. I know that when, when Donald Trump came down the escalator, the courage he showed that day and in the days that came and in the years that came really made me want to do something courageous. And so when I stepped away from my career and then somehow stepped into the arena of politics, I tapped into somebody else's courage. And I had a lot of people reach out to me and say, you just showed an act of courage and now I feel like I can do something courageous. It just takes one little step through that fear. I recently uh, wrote a book and it's, it's coming out right now. As a matter of fact, we're doing a book signing today and the book is called Unafraid and I titled it Unafraid because when you step through fear, the fear of being ostracized for having the wrong opinion, which is truly the right opinion these days, when you step through that fear, it's amazing. When you get to the other side, nothing can phase you. Nothing can make you afraid. And so I'm encouraging everybody today to find that thing that makes you afraid, whether it's speaking out, whether it is getting involved politically, whether it's ruffling some feathers, I encourage you to do that and step through that fear so that you too can be unafraid. I was at a book signing the other day and a mom came up to me and she was just, she had so much energy, you could just feel it oozing out of her. And I said, I just, I love your spirit, what do you do? And she said, oh, I'm just a mom. And I said, wait a minute, just a mom? You are the most powerful force on the planet? You are the most powerful force on the planet? It is the mama bears that are gonna, I think, save this world. It's the mama bears. The most dangerous place in all of nature is between a mother bear and her baby cubs. And the radical left have found themselves right there. And a lot of mama bears are just ready to tear them to shreds. So I wanna ask you, stand up if you've done something courageous like speaking out at a meeting, getting involved politically, Stand up, just to, if you've done something in the past, say month, that's courageous. Oh boy, this is, usually I get about five people, but okay. Now when somebody else sees that act, they stand up. When somebody sees that a mom got loud at a school board meeting protecting her children, they stand up and they wanna do something. This is how we take back our country, the government should not be trying to make us afraid of them. The government should be afraid of us. We the people, that government belongs to we the people and it's flipped around right now, but I know that with God, and we possess God inside each and every one of us, with God on our side, nothing can stop us from taking back this government, taking back this country, and having its best and brightest days ahead. I thank you so much for being here today. I look forward to meeting you after this and Thank you, Ralph, for putting this together. We need God and we need each and every one of you to step forward and be strong right now. Thank you. Appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Faith and Freedom Deputy Director of Voter Education, Adam Pipkin.
my Georgia peeps. That, that uh, makes Jason Williams happy and also offended all at the same time, since we've got a battle going on with North Carolina. But it is my honor and privilege to introduce our next candidate for president, Mr. Perry Johnson. He's a self-made businessman, problem solver, and quality expert from Michigan, a numbers guy. He started Perry Johnson Registrars, a company that put in place quality controls in the American automotive industry. He started over 80 companies worldwide providing quality standards in, in items from food to medical devices and airplanes. Mr. Perry Johnson is a family man and he and his wife have three sons. So y'all please give a warm FFC welcome to candidate for president, Perry Johnson. Well, good morning. I'm Perry Johnson, and I am running for President of the United States. I am probably too conservative for this group, but you might as well know, Jesus Christ is a huge part of my life, and I am pro-life, pro-Second Amendment, anti-woke, anti-China, and pro-freedom. <clears throat> And I'm going to tell Joe Biden right now that he cannot use the Justice Department to charge his opponent. It really is un-American. When I'm elected president, there will be four things that will be done right away. Number one, we're going to implement my two-cent plan. Basically, the government is spending too much money, and it's your money and they are causing moral decay in our entire country. Right now, instead of having the government spend every penny in their budget, I say we cut two cents out of every dollar of discretionary spending and we start balancing the budget. Number two, never again will a minor have transition therapy. And number three, although you're not gonna like this, we're getting rid of the Department of Education. Yeah. And, and number four, we are gonna finish the wall and stop this illegal immigration. Yeah. Now, I am a guy that grew up in a small town my dad was a pilot in World War II. My mom was a nurse in the Army Wax. They met at a New Year's Eve party, which was the luckiest break of my life. I would not be here today without that, but they love this country. They love this country more than life itself, and I feel the same way. We have the greatest country the world has ever known, and I want to keep it that way. But right now, we are $32 trillion in debt and we are risking the lives of our future, of our kids, of our whole country. One day they're gonna be asking you to cut Social Security, they're gonna be asking you to cut Medicaid, and they're gonna tell you, hey, I think we cannot afford the defense. And the only reason on earth that we have taxes is for national defense. I want more money in your hands. I say we start cutting taxes and trimming the government. Now, I have a reality series so you can find out what it's really like to run for presidents because the ups and downs are overwhelming. And if you go to perryjohnson.com slash backstage, you can find out about it. They did say that I had to have 40,000 donors even though I'm self-funding. I started with nothing and now I do have 80 companies because I've been bringing quality and efficiency to companies all my life. And the last thing in the world that they want is an efficiency expert in Washington. I'm surprised they let me land my plane. But you know the thing about this country is that we have a history of doing the impossible. Think about it, and think about this country and how we were founded. We were founded with an ideal, an ideal that we were gonna have a country unlike any country in the history of the world, a country by the people, for the people. And 
Life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness were going to be the foundation of our entire country. Now, to achieve that goal, we had to fight the most powerful army in the history of the world. We had to do it, even though we didn't know how to fight. We had no guns. They wouldn't let us have guns. We had a fledgling general by the name of George Washington. But you know what? We did the impossible. And we beat the greatest army in the history of the world. Why? Because we have that fire inside us, a fire that is unequaled. And when they look at us, we see Henry Ford, we see Vanderbilt, we see Edison, we see Carnegie, and we see the greatest nation the world has ever known. And the world looks at us and says, wow. Well, I say we keep it the greatest nation there was ever lived, and let God bless America, and God bless everything around us, because by golly, we are the greatest country that ever lived, and let's keep it that way. Hey, 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 let's do it. Let's do it now, because we are going to win this next election. Let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president and CEO of the Job Creators Network, Alfredo Ortiz. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Great. God is good. How many people here have credit card debt? How many people have auto loans? How many people have home loans? Well, guess what? Sleepy Joe just said he's going to wipe it all out. Who cares about the Constitution? Who cares about Congress? Who cares about the people? Who, wh who is this guy? It's ridiculous. Anyways, thank you very much, guys. I am the President and CEO of Job Creators Network. Um, we're going to go through this very fast. Guys, I only have less than five minutes, but that's okay. Because I'm here to say that my name is Alfredo Ortiz and I am not running for president of the United States. <laughs> so I will make it very fast for you. Uh, Job Creators Network is a national pro-business policy advocacy organization. Uh, we're the leading small business organization with over 500,000 members. How many people here, by the way, are small business owners? All right, lots of you. And I also hear that there are a lot of folks here from Georgia. <laughs> Go Georgia, I live in Roswell, the best state ever. Sorry, Tennessee or others out there, but go Georgia. <laughs> All right, next slide, please. Um, small business community is very important. If you could click through the next three. 30 million small business owners employ 60 million small business uh, employees uh, and, and actually have two thirds of new job growth creation is in the hands of small businesses. That is how important small businesses are to this country. And Joe Biden is after all our small businesses. I'm telling you, he declared a war on small business day one. Go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> Economic threats, Biden inflation. We all know it, we feel it, we see it. The worst, although uh, obviously our small business owners, they feel it every single day. They can't get away from it. They're also been hit with uh, uh, high energy prices, they've been hit with labor shortages, and obviously all the regulations from the COVID, they're barely trying to get out of it, and Biden isn't letting them, because you know why? Because small business owners represent everything that progressive left and that Biden administration hates, freedom, opportunity, that you work hard, you get uh, what you deserve when you work hard, they don't like that. So they are after our small businesses. Uh, access to credit, it's gone basically because of the high inflation. The Federal Reserve has had to increase interest rates by five points. Well, that's our killed our access to credit for small businesses. And government overreach. Next slide, please. Um, and we all know what's happening overall with Biden inflation. The average American worker and the average family is getting screwed. Sorry for the word, but they are. Look at that. 25 consecutive months of uh, declining wages. Next slide, please. 
Um, and like I said, our small business owners are very concerned about rising credit. About two thirds of our small business owners across the country, according to our poll, are very worried about access to credit. This is not good. When small business owners are worried about access to credit, guess what they don't do? They don't hire people. So this is not a good thing. So again, Biden is crucifying our small business owners and we have to push back and that's what we're doing. Next slide. Government overreach. How many of you heard about the $425 billion overreach of forgiving college student loans, right? Well, guess what? Our organization is one of the two lawsuits up in the Supreme Court that this week, God willing, we are gonna hear that they have sided with us and against the Biden administration and have overturned his, awesome, his incredible overreach once and for all. So we're, we're uh, very excited about that. Um, again, any, the decision of that is expected any day now. Next slide. Um, JCN, we're fighters for freedom, just like all of you. Uh, we're acting as a powerful voice in Washington, D.C. for our small businesses. We're pushing back on harmful policy agenda in real time and educating Americans in terms of uh, our uh, Americans and influencing policy day in and day out. Next slide. Uh, JC in action, we love doing billboards in New York, uh, in Times Square. I'm sure you guys probably heard of the famous uh, billboard that we did against AOC and Amazon. Uh, we started there and we haven't stopped. Here's a nice one that we put up in Times Square. Read my lips, no new recession. It's the economy, stupid, and he still hasn't gotten it. Next slide. Uh, we're in the Hill, we're in Baltimore Sun, local papers, we're on TV, we're on Fox. Next slide. And by the way, we have a new podcast. Finally, once and for all, our small business owners across the country have a megaphone, a national megaphone. And we're very excited to uh, announce our uh, podcast, uh, Main Street Matters. Next slide. And by the way, I wrote a book called Real Race Revolutionaries. Please read it. Laura Ingram thinks it's an excellent book. So if she thinks it's an excellent book, I hope you guys do as well. Uh, please read it, but it does talk about uh, how I believe that entrepreneurialism and entrepreneurship is the way to bridge our racial and economic divide in this country. Next slide. I think that's it. So join the fight with us. Thank you very much for your time. I did it right in time, five minutes. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage for the panel, Hispanics Untrafficking America. Faith and Freedom Hispanic Division's Director, Nilsa Alvarez. Founder of Fearless Identity, Luis Javier Ruiz. President and Founder of Untrafficked, Eric Colton. Senior Pastor of Presencia Viva Church, Edwin Castro and founder of Commission United Against Trafficking, Rosie Orozco. All right, well, we're gonna start with our amazing panel. As we saw last night at the pre-screening of Sound of Freedom, we know that there's a scourge in our nation called human trafficking, and sadly, uh, the Hispanic community is at the heart of that exploitation happening at our southern border. Uh, but before we jump into exactly what that looks like and how we can help untraffic America, let's start with uh, things that can lead uh, for the next generation to fall prey to traffickers. Um, we have a powerful testimony from Luis Javier Ruiz. Um, you have a popular documentary on Amazon called More Than a Victim, which details your, your testimony as a survivor of the Pulse nightclub shooting where two men lost their lives shielding you from the gunman. What happened on that tragic night and how did that lead to an encounter with God? Yeah, so thank you so much. It is an honor and a privilege to be here. Um, I remember just growing up and struggling with same-sex attractions and wishing that the church would have this conversation. 
And so when you don't find answers inside of the church, you go outside and look for answers in the wrong places. And uh, being my parents that were pastors struggling with same-sex attraction, I joined the army because I thought that would turn me straight. It made me actually more sexually promiscuous. I had a praying mom and dad that never compromised the gospel and always spoke truth to my identity in Jesus, and they prayed. And so Pulse Nightclub happened June 12, 2016, where 49 of my friends died, and many were injured, including myself. Who'd have thought that that's where the Lord would meet me? And so I remember just surviving from that shooting and raising my hands to the, to the Lord after I found out that I was HIV positive. And I asked the Lord, what do you want from me? I'm a gay man. And I remember the, the Holy Spirit coming into the room and saying, it's not a gay to straight thing, it's a lost to save thing. I want all of you, not just your sexuality. And I remember that's where the Lord met me, transform my life. I no longer identify as LGBTQ, I identify as a son of God. Yeah. What can you say to encourage pastors and parents who have youth or adult children currently in the LGBT movement? That's a great question. And Jesus, God, has a heart for the LGBT community. He had a heart for me. He loved me best while he was yet on the cross. And so I encourage pastors to talk about this. Have this conversation, because when you don't have it in the church house, they're going to find it outside, like I was trying to find it. And so I encourage you to be bold. Don't worry about them silencing you, canceling you as they're trying to do with us right now, mm -hmm. because it is the gospel that gives you power. And I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is power Amen. of God. And so it's time for the body of Christ to take their position and, and share the gospel with love and truth, and that's found yes. in Jesus. And, they can, and you can look up his ministry, Fearless Identity, they provide resources for churches to tackle this issue and with their testimonies at the helm. Thank you so much, Luis Javier. Absolutely. And that's a great segue to Pastor Edwin Castro, who is bold and unashamed to talk on today's issues from Scripture. And you've provided uh, a series uh, to the most influential Hispanic association, Pastors Association in Florida. Tell us about your series. Well, we have been working in the association for over 60 years. And uh, we are called to be together defending the truth. So the main uh, question that we have is, if the church do not defend the truth, who's going to do it? The Apostle Paul says that the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, who's going who's gonna to do that job? The media? The educational system? Who's going to do it? It's the church. So we are called to defend the truth. We are called to go back to the Bible. We are called to be bold and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Pastor, have you ever had to minister someone in your congregation or even on your team that has struggled with gender dysphoria? What does that look like in ministry? That's, that's a great question. You know, I believe that we are called to be just like Jesus. And the Bible said that Jesus was full of truth and grace. Not just truth, not just grace. So we need both. And, and that's the rule that we have, you know. As when Jesus encountered the adulterous woman, he said something very important. I condemn you not. Go and sin no more. So basically, the, the main point here is I accept you as you are but I don't approve the way that you're living. So if you have a true encounter with Jesus, you cannot be the same. Amen. Amen. And I know, you had, <clears throat> I know you had a member of your worship team that you were able to minister and, and help with struggles uh, in, that, in the gender conversation. I don't know if you want to share a little bit about that. Sure. I mean, there, there is a, a trace back to the, uh, something that we heard this morning, the, the father issue, you know? So there is, there is a void there, and, uh, and there is hope, which is the most important thing. You know, the church uh, has a, a, a very critical role in this process, and we can restore these people with love, but with truth again. Amen. And they have powerful testimonies of people being restored in their ministry. Um, Eric, 
you are the founder of Untrafficked, um, an organization that protects children from grooming and provides intel for law enforcement agencies across the country to successfully arrest human traffickers and rescue their victims. Since your organization's inception, how many traffickers have been arrested and how many victims have been rescued? Well, first, thank you so much for having us. And uh, we're grateful to be here. And uh, the Lord called us into this thing and we're just excited to continue to serve sacrificially. Uh, we completed 277 successful prevention and rescue operations. <laughs> and uh, all of them we did, uh, not by ourselves, but we, we worked with other organizations because collaboration is key and law enforcement. In the United States, it's very difficult because you have to work with law enforcement agencies in order to be able to accomplish a successful uh, recovery mission or any type of a mission because we are a nation of laws. And how many uh, victims have been rescued? Um, like I said, 277. Two, two oh, okay, yeah. and how many arrests? I'm sorry, because I know they get excited when they hear about the arrests. 589. <laughs> Wait, wow. how many? 589? We don't arrest anybody. Law enforcement does all of that. Yeah. So yeah. And just to let you know, like a lot of these numbers are not completely accurate because there are things that we don't know about. So this is a minimum number, not a maximum. And law enforcement's out there doing a bunch of things based upon our intel that we can't track. And so keep going, guys. Thank you so much. And we back the Yeah. Board. And what has been the fastest extraction your team has ever provided intel for? This was wild. Uh, a young girl, she was adopted into a family at five years old, at 15. Uh, her and her mother were, were both from different cultures. And she said, Mom, you don't understand me. And she decided to fall in love with a guy that she met on Instagram and never talked to. And uh, she was 15, he was 16. He said, my car's broken down, I'm gonna have my aunt come and pick you up. She was talking to a 42-year-old woman for six months and had no idea. And so we got the call five hours and 31 minutes later, 352 miles away, we got her. And so real quick, we do this by, we've established 257 law enforcement alliances. We've vetted and qualified 119 care facilities in 42 states so we can have a place to be able to take the survivors of sex trafficking, and then built a network of 77 other organizations that we collaborate with in order to do this. We just came back from Phoenix where we trained 641 Catholic youth and teen ministers. And then last night, we actually had to leave here for a few hours and go be a part of the Messianic uh, Jewish congregation to be able to present Untraffic and the Guardian program to those guys. Yes, thank you. And they have an amazing prevention program that you can share at your church, your home and community called the Guardian <clears throat> Program, and you can access it at untrafficked.org. That's untrafficked.org. Or just follow the tall man in the red polo. I told him no one can miss you. That's why he's a giant bullseye. Thank you so much for all that you do, Eric. Really, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Rosie Orozco, you are, uh, to me, a hero in the, in the battle to end human trafficking. You served in Congress in your home nation of Mexico, and you drafted the, the harshest anti-trafficking law that led to the closure of over 1,500 places of sales and exploitation of women and minors in your country. I mean, amazing. So how did this law impact the states in your country? Well, four of the states, my friends from Congress <clears throat> who were with me uh, became governors and closed the places where the girls were being sold. So uh, one of them, for example, Tamaulipas, when the governor arrived, it was uh, the third state with more violence, more disappearance of women, and a lot of killing. And now it's the 26th went Great. down to it went 26, down. yeah. That's, wow. that's the way, because those places are where everything is corrupted. They invite the police, they invite the law, law enforcement to be there, or even the mayor, and then everything gets corrupted. They take a picture and they, this, 
these people will not work anymore for the good side. They will be working for the traffickers. You work with over 100 uh, families whose, whose kids were abducted and smuggled into the U.S. for, yep. for trafficking. Um, where can people follow you on social media to see how they can help voice for these families and be part of the, the movement to end trafficking? In the website, uh, Kaleido, inc.org you can follow us on, on Instagram too and you can see how like in the border there is so many girls that are disappearing I was there with Sarah Carter with the senators Marsha Blackburn Cindy Hyde Smith and Kathy Britt we were there for two days and we saw with our eyes how many children were being crossed by the coyotes in Mexico, only last year, in 2022, 1,300 girls from 10 to 19 has been disappearing. Only last year. So we need to put this border in order. We need Amen. to give our countries a blank page, a new story to the victims, like what you are doing, it's incredible because this girl needs a new story, a blank page. Mm. So we challenge you to put the border in order. Amen. Well, let's stand up. Can you please give them a warm applause? Thank you so much for all you do. God bless. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Executive Director of California Faith and Freedom Coalition, Chad Schnitger. It is my pleasure to introduce the former candidate for governor of California, a New York Times best-selling author, an award-winning documentary filmmaker, one of the best known media figures in America today and candidate for the presidency of the United States of America. Please welcome Larry Elder. Thank you so much for that introduction. Thank you for not calling me the black face of white supremacy uh, as did the LA Times. I'm, call I'm, I'm coming to you virtually because uh, we spent a whole day campaigning in New Hampshire try to get the last flight out of Logan uh, to come here, uh, and it was canceled. We then tried to get a train. It was canceled. I'm blaming Mayor Pete. Now, why am I running? My father was a World War II Marine veteran. He was the first black Marines. They were called the Montford Point Marines. He served his country. My older brother, Kirk, uh, was a Navy-era Vietnam vet, uh, served in the Sixth Fleet in the Mediterranean. My little brother Dennis was actually in the army and he went to Vietnam. I'm the only one who never served in my family and I've never felt good about that. This is my opportunity to give back to a country that I love so much that's been so good to me and my family and that is why I'm here. I know I have something to contribute. I know I have something to say. As regards 45, I think President Trump did an amazing job and I think he would do an amazing job were he to be reelected. And in the event that he's both nominated, uh, I will absolutely support him and campaign for him if asked to do so. Here's my issue. I believe there are so many voters in swing states, particularly female voters in, sub in the suburbs, who would not vote for the man if he walked on water. In fact, if he did, they'd accuse him of not being able to swim. I have no idea what to do 
about Trump derangement syndrome. Maybe someday somebody will develop a vaccine. But I ask all of you who are supporting Donald Trump or who are supporting somebody else the following questions. Have you lost friends because of Donald Trump? I have three friends I've known for about 40 years each. We cannot speak to each other because I supported Donald Trump campaign with him. Are you now walking on eggshells at work because of Donald Trump and you can't have candid conversations? Do you have strained relations with family members and relatives because of Donald Trump? If the answer to those questions is yes, Houston, we have a problem and that problem is called electability. I believe at some point during this very long process, Republican voters are gonna realize they need to coalesce behind a candidate whose last name is other than Trump, but who has the same America first policies on the borders, on judges, on being pro-life, on supporting school choice, on stopping this nonsense that America uh, is systemically racist, on stopping this attack against police officers, on continuing the policies that gave us energy independence, on lowering taxes, on lowering reg regulations. We're gonna need somebody around whom the, the Democratic, the, the Republican party can support, but for whom a sufficient number of swing voters can vote so that we can win in November, 2024. It's all about electability. And I like to make the case that I'm that person around whom people ought to rally. To that point, I'm urging 40,000 people to go to my website, elderforpresident.com, make sure I'm eligible for that first debate in Milwaukee. You can give as little as you know as $1. And at the very least, I'm gonna get up there in that debate stage, and I'm gonna talk about a few issues that our side, in my opinion, does not address enough. Number one, the lie that America is systemically racist. It's not just a lie, it's not just offensive, it's not just pitting blacks against whites. It is getting people killed. How? It's called the Ferguson effect or the George Floyd effect. When you accuse the police of being systemically racist, they pull back. There are literally hundreds, if not thousands of people who are now dead, who otherwise wouldn't be dead, but for the fact that the cops are not doing their normal proactive policing. And guess what? The majority of these excess deaths are the very black and brown people that people on the left purport to care about. The other thing is this, we have to have, have to have school choice, particularly in urban America. There are 13 public high schools, I kid you not, 13 public high schools where 0% of the kids can do math at grade level. Another half a dozen, only 1% can. That's nearly half of all the public high schools in Baltimore, all of which are located in the inner city, where either 0% or only 1% of the kids can do math at grade level. This is beyond intolerable. It is a crisis. 53 government schools, that's the term I prefer, government schools in Chicago, 0% of the kids can do math at grade level. Again, all of these are located in the inner city. Nationwide, according to the national report called, report call called the National Assessment of Educational Policy, the national report card, 85% of black eighth graders, these are kids who are 13 years old, can neither do math nor read at grade level. Half can't even do basic reading, which means a substantial percentage of black kids in America are functionally illiterate. Yet the Democratic Party is adamantly opposed to school choice where the money follows the child rather than the other way around because they're wedded at the hip with the teachers union. And there was a study some years ago where government school teachers were asked, if you have school age kids, where do you put your own kids? Nationwide, 10% of us have our kids uh, in private school. 49% of Philadelphia government school teachers with school age kids put their own kids in private school. In Chicago, it was 39%. That's the equivalent of opening up a restaurant, putting up a sign saying, come on in, eat the food. We sure won't. The people who know the school system the best, the teachers, aren't putting their own kids in it. And then there's the 10,000 pound elephant in the room that our side does not talk enough about, their side does not talk at all about, and that is the epidemic of fatherlessness. In 1965, 25% of black kids entered the world without a father in the home married to the mother. Today, that number is nearly 70%. Nearly 50% of Hispanic kids 
into the world without a father in the home married to the mother. Today, 25% of white kids enter the home without a into the world without a father in the home married to the mother. 40% of all American kids enter the world without a father in the home married to the mother. And the stats are clear. If you are raised without a father, you are five times more likely to be poor and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of school, and 20 times more likely to end up in jail. What's happened? With the so-called war on poverty that's been launched in the mid-60s, we've now spent over $20 trillion on fighting poverty. We've incentivized women to marry the government. We've incentivized men to abandon their financial and moral responsibility. Every one of these kids in America who's growing up without a father needs to have a mentor. I liken it to AA, where if you're a recovering alcoholic, you have a sponsor. Every one of these kids needs somebody that they can contact, talk to, to provide them guidance and counseling to make sure they do the right thing. There are plenty of men who are now retired with a lot of time on their hands. Many of them are baby boomers. They should get involved, and I will encourage that. Also, we're spending a great deal of federal dollars on fighting poverty, uh, and these dollars are often inefficiently spent. We should encourage taxpayers to be able to check off on their own tax return where they want that money to go, whether it's religious organizations in their own community that are doing this kind of work or nonprofits in their own community that are doing this kind of work. We need to direct those funds so that we can affect change and make sure these kids have mentor and get the kind of counseling so they do the right thing. This is a marvelous country. Fatherlessness is not a death sentence. My father never knew his biological father. He dropped out of school in the eighth grade. My dad started a little cafe in his late 40s. When he retired, he owned that property, the property next door, plus the house that's still in our family. He retired with a little less than a million dollars net worth. That's what can happen in America. That's why I am running to encourage us to work hard, to stop the nonsense about America being systemically racist, to address the need for school choice, and to combat the breakdown of the nuclear intact family. We've got a country to save. I'm ready to serve. Thank you so much for listening to me. God bless. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome President of Paula White Ministries, Pastor Paula White Kane. I hear I'm among friends as uh, last night you guys gathered around a piano bar and about three to four people started worshiping and then the next thing I heard is about three to four hundred people lifting up their hands and singing praises right on the piano bar in the lobby. Well, that's what we have to do. We have to stand strong for faith, strong for God, and strong for what our pursuit and our inalienable rights are, the pursuit of life and happiness and all that God has given us. Proverbs 29, chapter two says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people mourn. We're tired of the mourning. We're tired of fighting a, a administration and a people that are really anti-faith. And I believe that God is not done in America. He is not finished with America. We must bring this nation back into alignment with that which was written from the beginning. When the land became a nation, this is the purpose for what she was established. Our true history records that an idea and a longing was, longing was in a heart of a people, a group of men and women from England, that God placed in them a longing for a homeland where they could be free to live their productivity and to worship God freely without restriction. That desire provided for them everything, to leave absolutely everything and come to this land. This nation was not great because of them coming and what they did. This nation has had many, many wrongs in its lifetime, but we also have been quick to fix our wrongs. Not everything was right in our history, but the greatness of America would be because we were established as a nation under God. This is vitally important for this moment because God 
led those pilgrims to the shore on the landing, planted that, those crosses on the beach, and through them, God prophesied his intentions to the nations. On April 29th in 1607, Reverend Robert Hunt prayed, we do hereby dedicate this land and ourselves to reach the people within these shores with the gospel of Jesus Christ and to raise up godly generations after us. And with these generations, take the kingdom of God to all the earth. May this covenant of dedication remain to all generations as long as the earth remains. And may this land be an evangelist to the world. They went on to quote Psalm 22. We've got a job to do. And I believe that God has called us for such a time as this and raised us up. You know, they will say that faith is over, but I believe the greatest move of God is now, that God is moving in this nation. Remember, sometimes before the brightest light are the darkest days. I just returned from an absolutely life-changing trip from Israel where we had 18 high-level meetings, and I'm so refreshed to run this race. While I pastor at City of Destiny and I'm the president of National Faith Advisory Board, for the first time in my life, I took a role in the presidential administration with President Trump as a senior advisor over faith initiative and opportunity because I wanted to serve my country and our faith community. We created an office that put a faith director and a staff and a budget in every single cabinet and every agency. President Trump expanded and understood how important faith was to our nation and that God is not through with America. It was so successful that post White House, I along with other former White House members and staff have continued the effort to promote pro-faith policies through the National Faith Advisory Board. We continue fighting for the faith community. Now I want you to imagine what we can accomplish if like Nehemiah, we all work together and align ourselves together for the plan and purpose of God. Fortunately, I don't have to imagine it because I had a front row seat to it in the Trump administration. We work tirelessly and nonstop to accomplish unprecedented things. And I want to show you the difference between a pro-faith and an anti-faith president. There were such contrasts between the current administration and the former administration. When we look at it since the start of Biden's administration, we tallied 18 pro-life policies implemented by President Trump that were overturned by Biden the very first year. 12 policies on religious liberty were reversed the very first year. When President Trump was in office, he wanted to make sure that religious liberty was priority. He signed an executive order to the Attorney General to issue guidance interpreting religious liberty protections under federal law in order to guide all agency complying with the federal, relevant, relevant federal law. We established the White House Faith and Opportunity Initiative a leaked HHS memo revealed the Biden administration plan to strip the Trump era religious freedom protections. Look, they do not want you to have your religious liberty. The UN just recently came out and said the LGBTQ is over religious liberty and freedom. Well, not before the eyes of God. Every person's right is to worship freely. Biden's Labor Department has rescinded the policy that we put in in labor in 2019 that provided religious organizations who contract with the federal government more clarity in regard to hiring practices. In short, it gave them peace of mind that they have freedom to uphold their religious convictions, hiring decisions, and not to worry about losing their contracts. I have about 50 things to go over with you in 35 seconds. So let me tell you like this. Today is the anniversary of the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Now we have a lot more work to do, but we accomplished so much. I just came back from Israel. The contrast is stark. Josh Reinstein gave me a list that every time a president goes in, they put something that they want them to accomplish, 10 things. Most don't accomplish anything. Some accomplish um, one at the most. He said, you guys accomplished all nine out of the 10. Unfortunately, 
Biden doesn't understand how important in his administration, how important Israel is to God. Just recently, they took where we defunded UNESCO and they put $600 million back to fund UNESCO against Israel. They have reinstated with the Palestine. He refuses to meet with Netanyahu. When he went over, he stood on the Palestine territory. I could go into so much more. I could tell you thing after thing that, that needs to be done. He's, he's watered down anti-Semitism. And this is your time, this is my time to stand up, to be a voice, to be a community, and fight for the original intention that God created this nation for. God bless you and God bless America, and God bless Ralph Reed and Faith and Freedom Coalition. Enormous migrant caravan, Title 42, set to expire on Thursday. At dawn, the migrants covered in blankets stretch for blocks. The policies that we have right now are encouraging people to come here to this country illegally. The border is approximately 2,000 miles long, about 19,000 officers. And that is not enough to deal with the influx of people coming in. I think it's very important for activists and for communities and, and people in general to get an opportunity to come to the border and see what's really happening here. Very broadly, I saw things I didn't expect. It's a, a mess. I mean, it's a, a humanitarian disaster. In my 20 years, we pulled out 12 bodies out of this channel. That's the reason that grid is there. That is to catch the bodies so they don't get sucked up in our pumps. And I know that not everyone We'll agree, but let's try to figure it out. And this can be something when we come together. It doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat. And like we've said, this is an American issue. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage for the panel, Media Bias, Faith in Media. Please welcome Chief Political Analyst for the Christian Broadcasting Network, David Brody investigative journalist and founder of Just the News, John Solomon. Online opinion editor for The Washington Times, Cheryl Chumley. And CNN political commentator, Alice Stewart. <laughs> well, we're all glad to be here today. Sorry, Chris Christie couldn't be here, I apologize. Uh, uh, we tried. But we said, boo, boo, no, no. Uh, all right, enough of that. Uh, media bias, so uh, the, the media is not biased. Good night, everybody. Uh, John Solomon, journalism, is it dead in America? John Solomon, can we give an applause for Thank John Solomon? Thank you. Now, over at Just the News, journalism is not dead in America, but, but overall, there's a feeling, especially in this crowd, that what has happened to journalism in America today? It's not dead, and listen, I still think it has a noble role in society. Our founding fathers intended a free press to be a very important part of our constitutional republic. It has certainly dinged itself up pretty bad, and I think the Trump year has left a legacy of really bad reporting that these institutions are just beginning to come to grips with. But if you saw the press conference yesterday at the White House for the first time since the Biden presidency began, I saw aggressive sort of reporting that is supposed to happen in the White House press room. So I see glimmers of hope. But there's a lot of work to do to re reconstitute the trust that all these people should uh, be allowed to have in the media. Yeah, Cheryl, what is your take on that as it relates to journalism uh, today in America and the changing media landscape that we see today? There's a lot of folks going to alternative media uh, because, let's be honest, there has been a negligence when it comes to the legacy media. They have not done their job. And because they haven't done their job, it's given oxygen to other networks and other alternative media alternatives. I actually see that as a positive, so long as uh, the citizens in America do their due diligence. And uh, as, a, as a journalist, I look at a, a wide variety of sources. I may be, be conservative, but I will go to the far leftist websites just to see what they're saying. And I think Americans, by and large, are getting on track with that. I think most Americans are smart. And they do their own research when it comes to uh, sifting through the myths and realities, myths and truths of news. And so I actually see that as a positive. Yeah. Alice, uh, you're in the belly of the beast a little bit there over at CNN. Um, talk to us a little bit about how 
that group, if you will, uh, they have a different worldview. And it's not an evangelical worldview for sure. So how, how does that kind of work? Because I think a lot of folks here uh, in this crowd are concerned that the media, they have a lot of concerns about the media, but, they, but that the media doesn't get the evangelical Christian worldview and therefore doesn't report on it really all that accurately. Look, I, I agree with John, the death of journalism is greatly exaggerated. And there are, keep in mind, there's media, and there are journalists, and there are outlets, and there are uh, individual reporters. And to paint the entire media with the swath that it is uh, dead yeah, is incorrect. There are individual reporters that do a phenomenal job, and they make sure and get the facts and present both sides of the story. But oftentimes, when there are liberal elites in the editorial decision-making process, um, there's obviously a different outtake. And looking at this from the bigger picture, whether we're talking about liberal elites that are in the um, editorial decision-making process, or we're talking about Hollywood, or we're talking even about sometimes higher education, three things we can take to the bank when it comes to liberal elites and uh, the Democrat mindset. One is that they're open-minded as long as you are like-minded, right? <laughs> they are pro-choice, provided your choice is abortion. And they also celebrate diversity, equity, and inclusion for everything except for ideology. Mm -hmm. So the challenge is, is that we have liberals that do not want to embrace a different mindset and a different ideology. The challenge that we all have is to make sure that we use our voice and use our platforms as journalists, as you do as well, David, to educate people and make a convincing case for why we are freedom-loving, faith, God-fearing people, and make sure that we articulate our arguments in a way that is not confrontational, but to broaden their understanding of why we feel the way we do. Yeah, you know, I just got back from a week uh, in New Mexico. I was with my, uh, and I love my mom. Uh, she's liberal, uh, and I love her. And we were watching MSNBC all week, so I was like on Excedrin and prescription meds. <laughs> The whole week. <laughs> and, and, and watching MSNBC for a whole week, other than putting me in a therapy, uh, was a really interesting uh, uh, situation because the language that they use. And then when she left and when she went to bed at like 8 p.m., I put on Fox, and it was a whole different situation. So it's just interesting to see the language that uh, and the buzzwords that are being used. And that's part of how that media bias comes into play. It feels like an osmosis situation here a little bit. Uh, talk, talk to me about that, John. Yeah, listen, I think the single greatest challenge that journalism has is it's lost its uh, obligation to neutrality. There just isn't neutrality anymore. And I think there's a secondary thing, and I saw this particularly when I worked at the Washington Post where I had a lot of fun, but there was a belief among the elitist reporters that they are smarter than all the rest of us in this world and that they must bring you to a certain conclusion. And so they spend a lot of time using loaded words to lead you to that conclusion, their ideology. And I think all journalism has to do is dial it back a little bit. I was a little heartbroken. I, I worked for Len Downey, who's one of the legendary editors in the, uh, the industry. It goes all the way back to a few good men, and, or um, all the president's men and Watergate. He was my editor when I was at the Washington Post, but he was saying something recently. We need to ab abandon objectivity and neutrality and try to find some moral imperative. And I, that's not our job. Our job is not to make your minds up. Our job is to give you neutral facts and let you make your own minds up. I think we just got to get out of the paternalism that so many media organizations try to impose on us today. Cheryl, is, is, there, is there hope here, though? I mean, the folks here, I, I'm assuming if we took a... A show of hands, I'm assuming most folks here would agree that, you know, we got major problems with the media and that there's no turning back. We're never going to get this back. You think we're going to get this back at all to, to some sort of semblance of, of honesty? Well, I, I think that it's a lost cause to expect MSNBC <laughs> to suddenly awaken to its bias and switch track. But I do think that because in America, anybody and everybody can start their own media organization John here is a perfect example. In two and a half years, he started a thriving media organization, very successful, and any American can do that. Uh, I think the optimistic note here is that particularly Christians in media, uh, faith in media is the key here because we are the ones who understand the link between God-given individual liberties and the importance of keeping a thriving faith community in America because you can't have God-given rights if you remove God.
And I think we're in a position to bring that worldview to all our reporting. That's a great point. Uh, what about the search for the truth, Alice? Uh, how can folks in this room kind of sift through everything that's out there? Because there's so many choices uh, and there's so many agendas out there. So, so what, what's some advice as it relates to uh, being a good consumer of news, if you will? The most important thing is to be honest with yourself and your friends and family that are consumers of news and recognize the fact there's a difference between a, a news program or a news publication and an opinion program, an opinion publication. And there is a lot what we see on both sides, whether we're talking about us as um, people of faith and Christians, we seek out certain types of coverage and there are, uh, there are people that might be more uh, left of center that seek out others. There is what we call confirmation bias. You go to certain news outlets to confirm your previously held biases on a certain topic. That's great. But I tend to try and look at all types of news. Real Clear Politics in the morning is a great aggregator of you can tell which is right, which is left, and which is more center. And challenge yourself. Read both sides and use your smart, critical thinking to come up with your own decision on what, what the truth is here. And I, I think it's incumbent upon everyone to, to, to really push the envelope and, and to look at all different types of news because there are, there's great content out there. And I, what I've also learned working on several presidential campaigns is your um, organization and people of the faith community are instrumental in spreading the, the good word of the faith community, whether it is online, on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, with your own organizations. And hats off to you, and I applaud you for using social media in a good, positive way to spread messages and information. We might not get on the news media, but you guys are awesome in terms of using social media tools that we didn't have before to get out critical messaging. Yeah, you know, there, I, I thought about, there's a term I kind of came up with years ago. I, we have a blurring of the lines between reporting and analysis, and I called it, we're in the age of the correspondent, uh, because they're a correspondent by day, and then they go on like a Rachel Maddow or CNN or something, or even Fox News by night, and, and there's something totally different. And, and it, so talk to me a little bit about the blurring of lines uh, here, because I think th this to me, and you guys do such a great job, John, at Just the News, about actually providing the source material so yeah. people can understand what's fact and what's not. Yeah, I, I think there are two things that are going on now, and you can see it, and I think you know, some of the senior editors I talk to at other major publications are beginning to appreciate this. There are a lot of reporters that come in with the self-determination of what the story is and then try to find the facts. And that's where journalism so often goes off the rails. You have to go in with an open mind, just like a police detective has to go into a murder case with an open mind, follow the facts, and then try to write a story that presents in fairly accurately and honestly what you've turned up. I think that a lot of the, the problems that newsrooms have it isn't even the punditry as much as it is. They start with the premise for the story and they never abandon it even if the facts yell something else. That's what Russia collusion was. If anyone who looked at the facts looked like, it's not here. All the FBI people I talked to said it's not here. And yet for two and a half years, our, our industry wrote that it was there. And mm. I think we have to get out of that, that mindset. You have to start with facts. They're a stubborn thing. And then write your stories when you put your facts together. Uh, yeah, no, I agree. Um, before we get out of here, I got to ask a Trump question because you know, you know, he's probably watching, going, "Yeah, you better ask a Trump question." <laughs> um, so, so Cheryl, you know, regarding Trump, I mean, he, he's a piece of work for sure. Uh, but, but what do you what do you make about how the media doesn't really has never gotten him? They, they try to cover him. They really don't understand him. They don't understand the connection that Trump and evangelicals have. It's just been interesting to watch. Like they, they, I mean, back to MSNBC in New Mexico with my mom for a week, they, they would not stop talking about Trump. Uh, but when it comes to evangelicals and Trump specifically, they try and uh, understand it, but they don't understand it. And it's just interesting to watch folks. That, that's like me, like talking about healthy eating. Like, no, I mean, <laughs> like, I don't know anything about that. So, so, so tell me a little bit about that. Because they, they look at Trump and they saw when he was on Twitter uh, active and going after people and they say, well, that's not godly. So how can you as an evangelical or how can you as a believer support that? Well, guess what? I'm an evangelical, I'm a Christian, and every now and then I let a cuss word drop. And it doesn't mean that I've lost my place in heaven. The thing that they don't get about Trump 
is that he fought for American principles, and he is still fighting for American principles. And he didn't do dopey things like hang pride flags from the White House in between two American flags, degrading our fine military. But he named the battle, he called out the deep state, which he was told it was all conspiracy, he's been proven to be true, and he called out the globalist forces that are rapidly, hurriedly coming for America's greatness. And he stood strong even when the media hated him, even when Democrats hated him predictably, but even when Republicans hated him. And he's still fighting that same fight today, and that's what they don't get. It's an American fight. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent point. And she's so true. I get asked all the time, as a Christian, oftentimes in whether, whatever outlet I'm on, how can you be a Christian and support uh, Trump? Look, we not, may not like how he does things, but he has delivered on what we wanted, right? We, we wanted a Scalia-like Supreme Court justices. We want someone who would support life, religious liberty, um, traditional families, and faith, and he delivered on those. So as a Christian, I say, you know, I'm not voting for him to be my pastor, but he has been a president who, who <laughs> delivered on what we want. <laughs> Well done. <laughs> That's good. And, and on that note, that is our panel. Thanks for being here. We're out of time. Chris Christie says hello. All right. <laughs> Great job, oh, guys. I go. Uh, go that way. We're at war with the most dangerous enemy that has ever faced mankind in his long climb from the swamp to the stars. And it's been said if we lose that war, and in so doing lose this way of freedom of ours, history will record with the greatest astonishment that those who had the most to lose did the least to prevent its happening. Tonight, there is violence in our streets, corruption in our highest offices, aimlessness amongst our youth, and there's a virtual despair among the many. During the 60s and the 70s, we were living in a darkness that I felt at times had a biblical feeling about it. Unfortunately, I see a lot of low energies. We just seem to be oblivious to the tsunami of liberal energy that's engulfing America. We have the donors, we have the voters, they're there. We just lack one thing, and that is entrepreneurial leadership. This year, there are thousands of principled, limited government, constitutional conservatives running for school board, for state office. We have hundreds of thousands of grassroots activists, millions of generous uh, donors, tens of millions of, of voters. With effective entrepreneurial leadership, I think we're within a few years of governing America. Our Republican cause is to free our people and light the way for liberty throughout the world. We're supposed to be the party of entrepreneurs. You are the leaders you've been waiting for. My advice is pick yourself. So you, you pick yourself. You run for, uh, for office, volunteer, blog, contribute, invest in growing your favorite conservative organization. You don't have a favorite conservative organization? Simple, start one. We need thousands of new single issue independent conservative organizations. I would remind you that extremism 
In the defense of liberty is no vice. And let me remind you also that moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. To be a home for the brave and to flourish as the land of the free. Not to stagnate in the swampland of collectivism, not to cringe before the bullying of communism. Conservatives, we have the opportunity of a lifetime in front of us. Don't wait for orders from headquarters. Rush to the sound of the guns. See you at the revolution. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage for the panel Against the Grain, Faith and Freedom Strategist of African American Engagement, Maggie Nicholas, author and activist, Pastor John Amanchukwu, Senior Advisor of Save America, Lynn Patton, former news anchor and political candidate, Carrie Lake, and CEO, Inter America Group, Jerry Pierce. Having a good time? Yeah. I have brought you today four gatekeepers. And why do I call them gatekeepers? All of you know in this room that you are not here by mistake. You are here because it is time to be at your gates. And when I say you need to be at your gates, we all know America has lost God's mooring mm -hmm. in legislators. We have lost this nation to evil. We are in the swamp, but we have brought Jesus here. Yeah. Can we all say amen? amen? Amen. I'd like to introduce to you John, Miss Pastor John Amanchuko. Yes, yeah. give him a round of applause. <laughs> John. You have traveled the country speaking at school board. Yeah. That's how you hear, yes. because you went viral. Right. Can you tell me, because my engagement is within the black community, under Faith and Freedom African American Voices. Can you tell me while you're out there, in this nation, calling upon Christ's people to rise up and tell the devil where he needs to be? Right. What do you think the black America state is at today? Well, first and foremost, I don't get my talking points from the RNC or the DNC. Amen. I get, I get my talking points from the B-I-B-L-E. Yeah. <laughs> and the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, it says, Woe to those who call evil good That's right. and good evil who put darkness for light and light for darkness, bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And so we live in a day where we're calling evil good. Mm -hmm. And the public school system, they're indoctrinating our children and we're calling transgenderism good, but it's really evil to mutate and to mutilate a child. We are calling critical race theory good, but it's really evil to shame whites out of being white right. and to make blacks feel guilty and make them feel vi victimized. These things are evil. And so as I go to school board meetings and I address what's going on in the black community, I am seeing that more minorities are beginning to open their eyes to the true injustice that's being wrought upon black America. Yes. And the lies that have been peddled by the left for so many years. Blacks are beginning to see that, you know what? White liberals don't know what's best for black America. Mm -hmm. We can speak for ourselves. Yes. We can talk for ourselves. And if we go back to the 50s and the 60s, blacks did better during that time frame than we do today because the focus was faith, family, and That's education right. void yes. of special interest. Yes. Thank you, John. And with Lynn, Lynn Patton, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Lynn, you have worked at HUD for a while. Yes. 
You oversaw the largest public housing authority in the United States during the Trump campaign, Trump uh, administration. We know the mainstream media call, um, call it Democrat leadership, right? We know the, the, the mainstream media called it a public policy stunt. Oh, yes. Right? But under Joe Biden, right now, if we walk around D.C., it's full of homeless. That's right. There is immigration problem. What would you like to have real change on the ground from your experience? Well, you know, it was an honor to work in the Trump administration. I've been with this man for 17 years, mm -hmm. first as a personal assistant, then as vice president at the Trump Organization, and then, of course, uh, at HUD as regional administrator uh, under Secretary Ben Carson, who we all love in this room. Yes. <laughs> yes. I moved into New York City public housing to bring attention to uh, the dilapidated conditions. You know, more people live in New York City public housing than live in the entire city of Miami. A lot of people don't realize that. Almost one in eight uh, New Yorkers walking the street. So, you know, the dilapidated buildings, the lead paint, the rats the size of cats, we had brown water, we had, um, you know, no heat and no hot water. Um, if the entire city of Miami lost air conditioning, um, that would make national news. Well, the entire New York City Public Housing Authority lost heat and hot water. You're talking about elderly folks who just did not have, they were freezing. Uh, you know, and so putting a spotlight on that was something that uh, was not a publicity stunt. It was actually uh, something that was very necessary. It had been uh, under local Democrat rule, uh, I, a man by the name of uh, uh, de Blasio that we all remember once upon a time. And, you know, they let this place uh, just completely get run down. When I went and lived in there, President Donald Trump saw me on Fox and Friends, called me up and said, Lynn, what is happening? I need right. to know more. Um, he grew up in Queens. He knows that these once used to be thriving properties. But, you know, at the end of the day, Trump was giving $40 million a week to public housing, and it still wasn't getting fixed. You know, if you give a businessman like that, that kind of money, you'd be living in a palace. Um, and so he wanted to know where that money was going. He demanded to know what we were doing with it. And, you know, for the first time in uh, public housing history, he assigned federal oversight. And that federal oversight is still here to this day, making sure that Democrats don't misappropriate the money that we were giving them, making sure that these people have decent, safe, and um, healthy living arrangements. And, you know, I think that that's something that was very important to President Trump. He gave more money to uh, these communities than any president since 1997. Yes, he and when he gets reelected in 2024, he'll do it again. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> And Jerry Pierce, please welcome Jerry. <laughs> Jerry and I have been friends for a while. <laughs> you spent so many years living outside of the U.S. as a Christian. Of course, as a businessman as well. What are your thoughts on the current U.S. immigration policy? Because I know that is your field. And you know this has been the biggest issue of America. It's a huge issue. It's a huge issue. Uh, hi, everybody, and welcome. Um, I'm uh, the oldest of five in my family. We didn't grow up with much. But uh, at the age of 17, I invited Jesus Christ into my heart, and my life was changed. Amen. I was able to go to one of the best universities in the land, Dartmouth College and have a great career there, both in academics and sports. When it came time to graduate, mm -hmm. I had to make a decision. Uh, work field, grad school, or professional football, or to follow um, my heart and become a missionary in Latin America. I chose missionary in Latin America. <laughs> Good job. I thought I'd be there one year or a couple of years. I was there five years. 
Wow. I've worked daily with the populations of many of the countries in Central America. Many of those who are coming here to this country. And not only we, the Americans, are being lied to, mm -hmm. they are being lied to. I need, we are not being told the truth about immigration. No. There's four different types of immigrants. <coughs> you have refugees, you have, um, you have uh, immigrants, illegal immigrants, immigrants, and migrants. Now, most people, uh, asylum seekers, excuse me, most people who are coming in right now are looking for asylum. The definition of asylum is extreme persecution for race uh, or religion or opinions, not for economic gain. And I know for a fact that the good people from these countries are looking for economic gain. There's a way to go through that uh, process that is legal. <laughs> you right. don't use asylum, asylum uh, sta uh, status uh, in order to get an improvement in your economic, decision, uh, economic positions. So this is a fallacy mm -hmm. um, and, and it should be corrected. Yes. We are lacking truth and we are lacking management. And um, it's a huge issue. Unfortunately, now uh, a, a tide has broken and many people have entered in not only good, but also bad. Yeah. And we may be seeing these results for many years, unfortunately. But it's not too late. We can still save it yes. and get it back in order with the proper leadership. That's right. Absolutely. And we need, we, we so thir we thirst for, for leadership. Yeah. There's no such thing anymore in this country. We look weak, we look poor, we just debunked, just like yes. Trump yeah. said all the time. And no one wants to accept responsibility no. for anything. Right. And please welcome Carrie Lake. Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> They used to attack you for being a former Democrat. Now they attack you for being MAGA Republican. <laughs> <laughs> so now talk to us about your journey, because we know you're going through that process you know, it's right interesting now. Because From I, Democrat to Republican. I just heard today that they're attacking RFK Jr., Robert F. Kennedy Jr. They're saying the, the left is attacking him, saying he's a MAGA Democrat. Wow. Wow. I think what we realize is that we are up against a, <laughs> a, a corrupt political machine, the Uniparty, it includes Democrats and Republicans versus America First. And President Trump helped us realize that. Amen. I grew up in the Midwest. I, I was born um, about an hour away from Ronald Reagan, a few decades apart. <laughs> and he was the president of my youth. He inspired me. I, he was my hero. And he inspired me to register as a Republican the day I turned 18. And I had been a registered Republican for decades. But during uh, my, the childbirth of my daughter and son, they were born a year and a half apart, I started seeing George W. Bush start war after war. And I said, when are these wars going to end? Well, here comes Obama and John McCain. As a journalist, I covered John McCain, and I knew he wasn't going to end the wars. Trust me. Mm. And so I took a chance with a newcomer. But I think what we've realized is that the newcomer the old establishment, they've all been part of keeping this swamp going. Mm -hmm. And it took a brash New Yorker, a bull in a china shop, to yes, come down that yes. escalator and wake us up. Yes. And wake us up. So, but it's funny because it, I was registered twi two years as, as a Democrat. And then I registered as an in independent. That's and, it? And they spent, like, they acted like uh, I was that forever. I, I said, <laughs> I'm just looking for somebody who's got some common sense. And we didn't have that. <laughs> 10 million Obama voters switched over and brought us President Donald J. Trump. Yeah, they did. And, Amazing. And now I think this next election, we're going to see an mm -hmm. exodus from mm -hmm. the Democrat Party yes. over to America First, because America First policies are the only way to get out of the mess that the Uniparty 
has gotten us into. And I'm looking forward to doing everything I can in the next year and four months to make sure that Donald J. Trump gets back in the White House. Woo! You heard it. Well, we're going to go back to John. You have this book called Erase. Yes, yes. Can you tell us more what led you to write this book? Because you came out of nowhere and you just like, there I am. Is it because that you are, you have had enough just like all of us? Can you tell us more about your book and why that led you to write it? Well, there's a false triune idol in the country that mimics the Trinity. It's called diversity, inclusion, and equity. Amen. That's right. I, I call it D-I-E because where there is D-I-E, there is death. And we are all being canceled and bludgeoned for not bowing to D-I-E, and we must resist it. And so I put together this book, Erased, to address critical race theory and the abortion movement and to label it, all, label it all as racism because the foundation of the abortion industry is in racism through Margaret Sanger, and it goes the same way when it comes to critical race theory as well. Okay, now that we are about to stop and finish our panel, I'd like each of you to say 10 seconds of what can we do as African American voices to gain this country back, all of us together. Jerry? Yes. Quickly. Uh, okay, first of all, I think save the inner cities. They're like in trouble. We need our inner cities. Republicans, don't be afraid to campaign in the inner cities. Infiltrate the inner cities. That's right. And you'll find a receptive audience. Yeah. Carrie? I would, I would never speak for the black community, but I would say that America first yeah. policies yeah. will, all ships will rise. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you're a Latin American, if you're Latino, if you're black, if you're Asian, if you're just a, a, a gringo, a mutt like me. Um, <laughs> when we have America First policies, everybody does better. And that's why we have to get out and talk about that and push for President Trump to get back in the White House. Yeah. And I would say, uh, the first thing I would say is get involved in your local community and your local chapters. Have dialogues with people on the other side. You know, most of the time we want the same things. You know, we care about the same things. And as Carrie said, America First policies, when I talk to people in the inner cities about the fact that we're giving $170 billion to a proxy war, that we're giving, uh, obviously, more benefits to illegals coming across the southern border, they don't want that either. Um, and so, you know, we have more common ground than we do differences. Thank you. John, last word? My last word would be the word. Second Chronicles 7 and 14. If my people who are called by my, by name, my name would humble Let's themselves and pray, this. seek my face and Let's turn from their wicked this. ways, yes. then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the co-founder of Moms for Liberty, Tiffany Justice. What an honor to be with you all here today. Last night I walked into the lobby and there were probably over 100 people singing Amazing Grace. And it was such a blessing um, because right now in America, our children are not okay. In Africa, there's a tribe, the Maasai tribe, and the way that they talk to each other when they say hello, how are the children? And the answer back that they want to hear is the children are well. If I asked you right now, how, what would your answer be? Not well. And now is the time to stand. So my name is Tiffany Justice. As they said, I am a mom of four beautiful children, 18 through 11, one girl, three boys, and a wife, thank you. Yeah, we can clap for moms, right? Moms are amazing. And I, in 2016, I decided to run for school board. My kids' school was in a state of disrepair. Um, we had a, a lot of leaks, the hallways flooded. I live in Florida. Um, and so I decided, well, maybe I could make a difference. Maybe I could try to help this school get renovated. I saw that other moms could get involved too. So I ran for school board, and I really got to see what the uh, fourth uh, branch of government, as Vivek Ramaswamy calls it, this administrative state that controls everything and how hard they work against you when you want to make change. And I'm here to tell you today that the public education system in America has become a jobs program that is more focused on what adults want than on what children need. But we're gonna change that. So I ran for school board. I had no idea that, you know, how many years later, seven years later, here I am speaking to all of you, co you know, running this organization with Tina Deskovich, another mom who ran for school board and then saw how broken our government was. And then COVID happened. And on this school board, I sat and I saw that our parental rights are being obliterated by our government every single day. And now is the time to stand. And Tina and I knew that we are not unique. We are moms who love and care about our children. And there are millions and millions of parents and moms just like us all over the country. And we said, it's time to unify all of these moms together. And then our chapter's now 300 strong, almost. Yep, we're very close to 300. In 45 states with over 130,000 members are unifying their community now as well. And our goal is to educate people on issues, to give them the facts, because the truth is on our side when it comes to our children. Love is an expertise. Don't let anyone tell you that they ever know better than you for your child, right? And then we empower parents to get involved and community members and grandparents. So we're not just moms, we're dads and moms and aunts and uncles and other community members that are concerned about what's happening in America. Our mission statement is to unify, educate, and empower parents to defend their parental rights at every level of government. And we are doing that every single day. Yeah, let's clap. Clap for the moms because they are under attack. And they are under attack every day, and that means that we are right on target, right? When the President Biden tells you these aren't your children, they're all of our children, you need to reject that. We need to tell him, no, sir, they are not your children. We do not co-parent with the government. One of the biggest threats to the national security of this country, I believe, is that nearly two-thirds of American children are not reading on grade level in schools. That should make you angry. It should make us angry. We spent over $800 billion in education this, come, this year. And these outcomes are abysmal. So I ask you today to stand with us. Stand with moms. We are joyful warriors. We are gonna fight like heck for this country because it is a privilege. And we're gonna do it with a smile on our faces because our children are watching us. Everyone in this room has been given a gift. I know you have, we all have. We need to find it and we need to use it starting today in service of our children. 
Thomas Paine said, if there must be trouble, let it come in my day so that my children may live in peace. And I ask you to stand and fight with Moms for Liberty. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all today. Very much appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the executive director of the Texas Faith and Freedom Coalition, Don Garner. Good morning. It's great to be with you folks. If you are half as blessed as I feel to participate in a conference like this, to be associated with an organization the caliber of Faith and Freedom Coalition, then you are, are truly blessed. I've been asked to introduce uh, former Congressman Will Hurd from the great state of Texas. Have you, have you heard of Texas? Uh, and by the way, if, if you happen to hail from Texas, either as your state of origin or your state of residence, please stop me if you see me around somewhere. I would, I would be delighted to meet you. Uh, former Congressman Hurd represented the 23rd Congressional District in the Lone Star State. Previous to that, he served his country by serving in the CIA with post in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. And folks, I have to tell you, I'm in awe of that. Uh, all of my knowledge of the CIA, I must confess, comes from Jason Bourne. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for laughing. Uh, in Congress, this is, uh, this is a big deal. Uh, I heard ranked third among freshman House members who had the most bills passed. That is not, that's heavy lifting. Uh, much of Heard's work focused on cybersecurity and technology. Folks, please join me in welcoming a fellow Texan to the stage, uh, the Honorable Will Hurd. Howdy. 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 We've got a few Texans up in here. Um, I, many of y'all don't know who I am. Thanks for like the three people that clapped. Uh, <laughs> one of them was my wife. And, and what I'm gonna do in the next five and a half minutes is just tell you a little about who I am. Let's start with the simple things. My name is Jason Bourne. <laughs> no, not joking, not joking. Uh, my name is Will Hurd. I grew up in San Antonio, Texas. I was a mama's boy. Thank you for San Antonio. I was a mama's boy. You know, I had a speech impediment until I was in high school. Uh, my head has literally been this size uh, since I was four. Uh, I, have, I have documentation of this. Uh, my last name rhymes with nerd. I shouldn't laugh loud because someone's going to use that against me. <clears throat> but it was my mother and my mom's undying love that helped me get through all those issues. Oh, and also, I was 14 shoe when I was in the fifth grade. Right? Um, though, to, to say I was bullied is, is an understatement. Now, I'm glad I grew up before social media uh, because the bullying stopped at 3.30 when I went home. But this was something that, for me, uh, impacted my life and for me to be able to fight for people that need help being fought for. You know, it gave me an opportunity. I, I, loved, I loved tinkering with stuff. I ended up getting involved in computer science when I was in high school. I studied that when I was at Texas A&M University. And I had never really been outside of Texas. And it was my freshman year, and I'm walking across campus, and I see a sign, take two journalism classes for $425. And I had 450 bucks in my bank account. So I go to Mexico. Fell in love being in another culture, caused me to add international studies as a minor, and then I had a professor who was a former CIA officer, and it changed my life. And that's when I decided, and I got accepted to go into the CIA when I was 22. My job was to stop terrorists from blowing up our homeland, prevent Russian spies from stealing our secrets, and put nuclear weapons proliferators out of job. And one experience I had when I was, a, when I was in my first tour, I was in a, another country, and before you go meet someone who has secrets, you have to make sure you don't have surveillance. And I'm in a Toyota Tercel, which is a very small car. And I turned down an alley, which I thought was going to be devoid of people. When I turned down it, it was like a parade. A couple thousand people. 
There were people hawking their ware. There was pack animals. And I'm driving about four miles an hour down this alley. This woman walks in front of my car. I mash on my brake, roll over her flip-flop, drag her foot across the concrete. Bleeding everywhere. She looks in the car and realizes I'm not from around there and starts screaming bloody murder. I have hundreds of people banging on the car, shaking the car. Now, in this situation, you're taught, get off the X. The X is the location where something's going to down, and the last place you want to be when something's going down is where it's going down. But my little Tercel wasn't going to be able to get me that far. I had a weapon, but not enough ammunition for this situation. I did what the people least expected me to do. I got out of my car. I unfold my six foot three frame. I knew some of the local language were not good enough for this situation. And I said, who? Does anybody speak English? I will remember this kid's face for the rest of my life. He parts the crowd, raises a finger in the air, and says, I speak the English. I said, sir, where's the closest hospital? He said, a couple blocks away. Fetch me a rickshaw. It's a little scooter with a, ca with a carriage attached to it. Took some money out, gave it to the rickshaw driver. Said, take her to the hospital immediately. She gets in the rickshaw, and it drives away. And the crowd starts clapping. They're patting me on the back. Some dude even opened my car door up and helped shove my six foot three frame into the car. And the sea of people part, and I drive away. And I look in the rear view mirror, and everybody's waving at me, right? And my heart is beating, right? My heart, my, my heart is beating because I thought my mother was gonna get a phone call no mother ever wants to get. Now I share that story as an example of how there are thousands of men and women every single day putting themselves in harm's way in order for us to enjoy the freedoms that we have here in the United States. It was an experience <clears throat> that made me realize that I had the opportunity to serve my country in a way other people haven't. And my dear mother, may she rest in peace. We lost her this year. She always says you're either part of the problem or part of the solution. And so to honor my mother and to honor those men and women that are putting themselves in harm's way and to take care of people all across this country, this is why I'm engaging in the debate about what the future of our country needs. And that's why I decided to run for president. My name is Will Hurd. I hope to earn your trust over these next couple of weeks and months. God bless you, and may God continue to bless these United States of America. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Executive Director of the Georgia Faith and Freedom Coalition, Mac Parnell. Good morning, everyone. Such a pleasure to be with y'all again. Uh, I have a distinct honor of introducing our next speaker. I'm going to be uh, very brief, but uh, I'm just going to tell you about four phone calls and one letter right before I, right before I bring him on stage. Uh, he also happens to be my father-in-law, uh, so that's a true honor. And, and, and the person I'm introducing is Representative Barry Loudermilk. He represents Georgia's 11th Congressional District. The first phone call is actually one my wife received. It was in 2017. She received a phone call from a uh, congressman's chief of staff saying, you're gonna hear about it on the news, but there's been a shooting on, a congressional, on the congressional baseball field practice. Congressman Loudermilk was on that field. He was shot at 22 times. The next phone call, oddly enough, was a couple weeks later. It was a one my wife received about 2 a.m. one morning. It was uh, Congressman Loudermilk saying, we've been rear-ended, somebody was going 90, our car flipped over several times, they're pulling your mother out of the car now. She was fine, but that's what he said at the time in the shock, and so they didn't know what that meant. Third phone call uh, was another shooting. It was actually, I was calling Congressman Loudermilk to talk about a flat tire, and I found a AR round in the bumper of the car that he was just driving. Somebody had taken another shot at him. Fourth phone call, I was sitting in his office in Washington, D.C., and he called me and said, hey, you're gonna hear about this on the news. Uh, we were just in a train accident on the way to the uh, Congressional Study Committee that we were going to. And the letter 
was a letter that Congressman Benny Thompson released to the media, didn't send to him, accusing him of giving treasonous tours of the, White, uh, of, of the Capitol grounds on January 5th. This letter was so egregious that the Capitol Police came out and said, these allegations are completely false. But in God's sense of divine providence, and because of his dedication and continued fight, Congressman Loudermilk is now the one leading the investigation to what actually happened on January 6th. Please join me in welcoming Congressman Barry Loudermilk. Thank you, Mac. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you here again today, and I appreciate uh, Max so much. He's a very smart individual. He did marry my daughter, by the way. So <laughs> well, let me tell you something. Yeah, some bad stuff has happened to me, and people ask all the time, why are you still in this fight? You saw more combat in Congress than you did in the military, so why are you still here? And I tell you, because I love this country, and it's not about me. And I, I want to prepare you for battle because if you're going to stand for freedom and you're going to fight for this country, you're going to go through things like this. The Bible tells us in Romans that you are blessed or you should take joy in tribulation because it's preparing you and building your faith is preparing you for tougher things to come. And when you're falsely accused, it says we're blessed. We have to look at things that way as when we're facing tribulation, it means you're doing something right. But we always have to have our mind and our conscience on the cause, not the circumstance. And we have to remember that. There is a picture that I hang in my office at, at home to remind me of this, that we have to keep our eyes on our cause, not our circumstance. It's a picture of the D-Day landing. It's a Higgins boat, and you can see the American soldiers as they are on the boat, as they are um, about to disembark into li the literal hell of battle. Now, every one of these men that are coming off of that, that landing craft, they know fully well what they're going into. If you look at the picture, you can already see bodies of other soldiers laying on the shore. You can actually see ripples in the water where bullets are hitting. These young men are about to do something. They know very well that more than likely they're not going to see the sunset of that day. Now, as Ronald Reagan said, they're giving two lives for the cause of liberty, the life that they live now and the life they would have had. Now, my dad was in on the D-Day invasion. He was a medic in the Army. And so I grew up with these images and these pictures and stories of how horrific things were that day. And I used to sit and, and I would look at this picture and I would just think, you, you never see the face of them except for one guy. He's turned and he's looking to the left and, and it's because he's probably a sergeant and he's checking on his men, but the rest of them are looking forward and I'm thinking, what are they thinking at this moment? What would be going through their mind? Especially when I was in the military, I used to think, I could be in this situation, what would I do? Knowing that I'm facing imminent death, I may not see my family again. Then I realized I'm asking the wrong question, not what's going through their mind. The question is what is not going through their mind. And that answer is what's in it for me. That never went through the mind of any one of these soldiers. That cannot be what's in our mind. Now, I know that uh, you saw a screening of the new movie, Sound of Freedom, yesterday. I had the opportunity to host Jim Caviezel, who played Tim Ballard in the movie. He was up at the, he was at the Capitol on Wednesday of this week, and we met with a speaker, and we're going to show that movie in the Congressional Auditorium uh, in the next couple of weeks. But I want you to think about something that happened in that movie. You know. Jim Caviezel, as he was playing Tim Ballard, says, God's children are not for sale. That is an important, important moment in that, that, that movie because what he's defining is the cause of why he's there. You know, he quits the, the Department of Homeland Security because they're trying to call him back. 
He's going to be embedded in the cartels trying to rescue children without the support of the United States government. Tim Ballard told me the bureaucracy got in the way. We've got to fix the bureaucracy. But here's, here's what you have to do because you are going to go through this. You're going to go through these things. Hopefully you never get shot at. It's not very fun. Hopefully you're not run over by another car or in a train wreck. But you will be falsely accused. You will be accused of doing things that, that you have never done, nor what you believe. But just like George Washington impressed upon our continental soldiers who faced circumstances of imminent defeat through the entire time that they were fighting, you keep your eyes on your cause, not the circumstances before you. That's exactly what these men are doing. They're keeping their eyes forward on the cause for which they're fighting, not the circumstances that stand around them because they're not in it for themselves. They're in it for a future generation. They had a cause which our founders left to them. And this cause is, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of, pursuit of happiness. That governments are instituted among men to preserve these rights, that's our cause, to preserve the rights of future Americans going forward. Keep your eye on the cause, not your circumstances. God bless you, God bless the great United States of America. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome conservative commentator and radio host, Todd Starnes. Well, hello everybody, hope y'all are doing well. Uh, it is an honor to be here. I'm a little bit in a bad mood though, and I need to explain why. Uh, originally from Memphis, Tennessee, but I've spent the last eight days anchoring in New York City on Newsmax, which has been great news. Uh, but I have to tell you, I haven't had a biscuit or a glass of sweet tea in all that time. So <laughs> I will marry the first woman who brings a jug of sweet tea right up here to the plant right now. You know, there's, there's something very interesting about our national anthem. Do you realize that our national anthem is the only anthem in the entire world that actually asks a question? You know, Ronald Reagan pointed that out in a speech many years ago. Does that flag still wave for the land of the free and the home of the brave? I believe it's an appropriate question for us to ask during this great American experiment where freedom is not passed along to our children in the bloodstream. Every generation must answer the call. And what strange times we live in. We've gone from the greatest generation to the entitlement generation. We've gone from John Wayne to men who exfoliate and wear Spanx. The newly crowned Miss San Francisco is a man. Imagine that, the most attractive woman in the Bay Area has a five o'clock shadow and hairy legs. <laughs> and we've gone from Matlock to Merrick Garland. We now live in a police state, a banana republic, where the ruling class jails its political and cultural enemies while turning a blind eye to the criminal enterprise of its own. Hillary Clinton and her minions destroyed emails with hammers and bleach bit. Joe Biden hit an untold number of classified documents in his home, his garage, and even Chinatown. Both should be doing a hard time in a federal pen, and so should Hunter. But instead, the Justice Department targets President Trump. They target America First conservatives. They target law-abiding gun owners, Christians, Antifa burns down city blocks without fear of prosecution. Meanwhile, the FBI, they're staging guns drawn pre-dawn raids on the homes of pro-life leaders. Black Lives Matter, they clash with police, no charges filed, while the FBI knocks on the doors of parents who complain at school board meetings. This is what the weaponization of the federal government looks like. You know, President Trump could literally spend the rest of his life in jail for the crime of what? Beating Hillary Clinton. Yeah. Meanwhile, 
Hunter Biden is a free man cleared by the feds to strip buck naked, smoke crack, and cavort with prostitutes. But the greatest threat to our nation is this, this effort to fundamentally transform the American family. Every one of our beloved institutions right now has been targeted by the sex and the gender revolutionaries. The other day, President Biden invited thousands of people to the White House for his gay palooza. Transgender activists disrobed in front of children, a transgender flag draped over the balcony, a clear violation of the US flag code. But understand this, ladies and gentlemen, Joe Biden and the progressives pledge allegiance to that flag and not the Star Spangled Banner. It was John Adams, our second president, said our Constitution is wholly inadequate for anyone other than a moral and religious people. So when you take God out of our founding documents, you get chaos in the culture. And that's what's happening in America. You take away the nation's moral foundation and you wind up with pronoun confused soy boys running around buck naked on the lawn of the White House and nobody wants to see that America. It really is the culture war battle of our generation. And now the nation is at a moral tipping point. Now I believe the average gay person in America just wants to live their life cling to the American dream, I respect that. You do you. But live and let live is no longer relevant in our society. What's happening today is not about tolerance. It's about assimilation and resistance to that is futile. If you believe in the biblical definition of marriage, you're labeled a homophobe. If you believe that it's wrong for boys to be in the girls' locker room, you're transphobic. Just ask Riley Gaines. Disagree with the alphabet activists, they will destroy you. Just ask Anthony Bass of the Toronto Blue Jays, now labeled anti-queer and on the unemployment line. Oh, their jihad is being waged all over our great nation, from the White House to the Church House, and soon, ladies and gentlemen, to our house. Just yesterday in New York City, dozens of activists marched in the streets chanting, we're coming for your children. It's trending today on Twitter. All that to say, get ready, America and be prepared for the knock on your door. Be prepared to give an answer. When Joe Biden demands to know, do you pledge allegiance to that rainbow flag or do you pledge allegiance to old glory? And I ask you, my fellow patriots, where does your allegiance lie? Are we one nation under God or one nation under the heathen Democrats? Are we one nation under God or one nation under the pronoun confused progressives? I believe the time for choosing is now. So I leave you with these words from the great hymn writer. Rise up, O men of God. Rise up, O women of God. Take your place in the public square. March to the ballot box on election day. Cast your ballot for the man who will make America great again. And together, and together, let us answer Francis Scott Key's question of the ages. Yes, we can see by the dawn's early light those broad stripes and those bright stars. They made it through the perilous fight, and oh, they are gallantly streaming. From the lakes of Minnesota to the hills of Tennessee, yes, by God's good grace, the flag still waves over the land of the free and the home of the brave. God bless you all. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage for the panel, Public Safety Solutions for America, a conversation between former Deputy Director of the Office of American Innovation, Jerron Smith, founder of Breaking Barriers United, Ryan Tillman, and the Executive Director of the Faith and Freedom Coalition, Timothy Head.
Well, uh, you never have to ask Todd to, uh, to kind of put his shoulder into it, you know? Todd Starnes is always good for a good time. So listen, this is a good, a good conversation, I think, a timely conversation to, for us to have uh, right now in America. And um, safety is always either explicitly or impliedly at the top of the ballot in every election. If things are safe, we don't really talk about it quite as much. If we think that they're not quite as safe, man, that is top of mind for all of us across the country. And right now there are a lot of pockets across the country that we actually don't feel safe like we did three, four, uh, certainly five years ago. And so uh, you know, we're, we're interested in having this conversation because unfortunately a lot of the solutions that are being put out there uh, by our friends on the left, they're, they're, they're ideological statements for a practical problem and we can't afford to actually take any wrong steps here. So I'm uh, joined, as we just, uh, just talked about, by Jerron and Ryan, a couple of folks that have a lot of history in this, uh, this issue. And uh, Jerron, I want you uh, to, to tell us a little bit. Uh, you worked in the White House on these issues, but before you worked uh, with the Trump White House, you, uh, you also have had a number of other roles in the realm of public safety and, uh, and the justice system. Kick us off by uh, filling us in a little bit about that. Sure. Well, one, thank you all for uh, having me and uh, being allowed to have this conversation around public safety. Um, so I, I worked on Capitol Hill for 10 years, so I spent time working for members like Jim Jordan, uh, Mike Pence, um, as well as Senator Tim Scott, uh, and working on uh, holistic solutions around underserved communities. I was recruited to the Trump White House where I uh, was director of uh, urban affairs and revitalization policy. Um, and then I was quickly promoted to being the deputy assistant for um, Domestic Policy Council. Um, and as the leader on the negotiations around criminal justice reform, we were able to pass legislation called the First Step Act, which was laser focused on reducing recidivism um, in our federal prisons. Um, we learned from states like Texas and Georgia that if we're able to um, ensure that individuals that come into the prison don't return to the prison, we can increase public safety. And we were um, drastically successful because a person who got out on the first step back are 70% less likely to commit a crime and come back into jail. And so that's been a huge success, and we've taken some of those successes to develop. Oh, yeah, you can clap. Right. <laughs> We've taken some of those successes and are using that to form uh, what, what I'm now doing, which is public safety solutions for America. Yeah, so working with state, uh, with governors and state legislatures across the country on, on similar approaches that the Trump administration had uh, to make in our communities and our, seats, our streets safer. So speaking of safer streets, um, so, uh, you know, Ryan, uh, you work a lot in some now in the realm of public policy, but you actually, I haven't always worked uh, you know, with uh, with kind of pen and pencil, that you uh, you actually have a really interesting background uh, that led you into this realm. Talk to us a little bit about uh, where you you kind of got your feet wet on this stuff. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So I was one of those guys that did not like police officers before I became one. I was the guy that was always calling them the man, the pigs. That was me, unfortunately, and that was over 10 years ago. Um, but one of my wife got pregnant at the time, and after after she got pregnant, I prayed about what God wanted me to do. And after praying what, uh, about what he wanted me to do, the doors to law enforcement just flew open. Mm. So I got hired as a police officer, walked in the door, and I still didn't know if this is what I wanted to do. And then it wasn't until I got off of training that I actually understood why law enforcement officers do what they do, how they do what they do, and what they do. And that actually set me out on a mission. So this was right around the time where Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson. And I remember as a black officer, it just made me feel terrible about being an officer. Yeah. So I went out there and I said, you know, I gotta do something to change the way people view law enforcement. So I set out on a mission. I created an organization called Breaking Barriers United about eight years ago. And its sole purpose is to bridge the gap between law enforcement and the community and change the face of modern day policing. And so right now I'm focused on really trying to get the community to understand and stop responding from, a, from an emotional state, uh, frame of mind yeah. and respond from a logical state of mind. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> So, you know, one of the things that we, we try to do, again, at this conference, we talked a lot about telling the good stories that are out there that just kind of are, are, are quietly uh, going about their business, not necessarily seeking fanfare. And that's the, exactly the reason why we wanted to bring uh, Ryan and Jerron here. Uh, walk us through a little bit some public safety solutions um, using some of these principles, like you said, that, that found them their way into First Step, and now that the First Step Act is being implemented by the Department of Justice, believe it or not, uh, this is a, a public policy 
that is, is starting to have empirical results that are like defying uh, uh, industri industry norms. I mean, this is radically a successful piece of policy. How can we think through those policies and approaches uh, again, in communities, say, uh, states, and even institutions right now, and making, again, communities and streets safer, John. Sure, so I've always lived in the inner city, um, even here in Washington, D.C., um, and when I left my service at the White House, um, I just had twins, and one day when I was at home, someone uh, started shooting a gun in the air um, right after someone else got shot uh, a couple days before, and uh, I felt terrible, um, and I worried about the safety of my wife and kids, and as a result, I moved. Um, I moved to a suburb which was um, safer for my family. Um, but then I realized that there's individuals that lived in that community don't have that um, flexibility or opportunity to move. And so we formed public safety solutions. Um, I was able to work with some uh, individuals that worked around First Step Back, um, organizations like Faith, um, Faith and Freedom, um, organizations like America for Prosperity and American Conservative Union. Um, and as well as groups like major city chiefs um, and leaders like Alice Marie Johnson. Um, and we have about 30 different organizations, a part of this coalition, focused on four principles. One, fund the police. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. fund the police, Absolutely. give them all the uh, um, resources they need to retain police officers, to hire best in class police officers, best in class training. Number two, we want the police to focus on solving violent crime and preventing violent crime. In so many different scenarios, maybe 7% of um, the police time is spent on those issues. And so they need to spend all of their time on those issues to keep us safe. Yeah. Um, thirdly, we want to focus on evidence-based policies that we know are proven to stop violent crime. Things like focused deterrence, where you offer um, carrot and the stick approach towards um, communities by working with community leaders, and at the same time, bringing the heavy end of the law and accountability to those people who want to break, break um, crimes. And uh, lastly, um, it's again around smart on crime policies, which is like the first step back. Policies that focus on public safety first. You know, with any other issue, you know, education reform, banking reform, you always could maybe make a mistake, but then go back and fix it. If you make a mistake around justice reform issues, someone could lose their life. And you can't bring someone back to life after you've um, done the, the work that you did around public policy. And so that's what our coalition is doing, and we're doing a cities tour um, throughout the country currently now. That's right. So, uh, and we're actually uh, uh, looking forward uh, as uh, Faith and Freedom as an organization to uh, helping to facilitate some of those in the uh, the remainder of this year. So, uh, so thanks for being with us today, but also in the coming months as we uh, as we talk through some of these really important issues. So, Ryan, you know, uh, briefly as we as we start to kind of uh, 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 land in places, breaking barriers uh, implies that there are barriers. Absolutely. And uh, so, barriers not only um, between beat cops and uh, the communities that they're policing, but also. Uh, barriers probably b between community, you know, between smaller communities in major metropolitan areas. Uh, tell us, you know, thoughts as well as experience from your vantage point. How can we actually uh, work with law enforcement, support law enforcement, uh, but also bring communities together through this process instead of uh, continuing to be divided? Yeah, absolutely. So the reality is, is that when it comes down to, it, we all pretty much want the same thing. We want to be safe. You know, we, I want my wife to be safe. We were in Chicago yesterday, and I want her to be safe when she's, when I'm not there. And there's people in the neighborhood that want to be safe. But we've all been led to believe that, you know, oh, we got to be nice to a lot of these people that are committing a lot of these heinous crimes. And so what I've realized is that a lot of people just, they don't have the education that I necessarily have now. And because of that, they, again, like I said earlier, we respond emotionally. So when you see police do something, when you see police use force, it's never going to be pretty. Police use of force, anytime you use force on another human being, is not going to be pretty. And so a lot of times we sensationalize that. But when you understand the context and why that force was used, it makes you understand things completely different, and it actually brings everything more into a, a clearer picture. I'll give you an example. We have a, a series right now on YouTube called uh, Switched. And we switch the roles between law enforcement and the community. So if you guys are ever bored and want some entertainment, go watch Switched. But it's interesting because we put celebrities in there. So we put Redman, we put uh, DJ Envy from The Breakfast Club, we put pastors, we put councilmen, and we switched the roles of law enforcement. Huh. And it's crazy to see how they respond. Well, I call it edutainment because <laughs> it's entertaining, but it's also educational. 
And what they say is, they say, man, I actually understand exactly what you guys do and why you use that level of force because I was in fear of my life in this scenario. And so the point is, is I think the way we break barriers between the communities that we serve is by educating them on what we do. And we've actually, as law enforcement officers, dropped the ball on that in many different ways because we go out there, we use force, and then we, we just go about our way and we you know, go back to what we did. We're now starting to understand that we have to be able to educate the community on what we do, why we do it, and how we do it, and that's the only way we're gonna be able to break barriers. Perfectly said, so <clears throat> that's right. So here's, here's uh, uh, we'll, we'll take a quick focus group. When uh, the unfortunate reality, you're, you know, to your point, Ryan, when, uh, when there is force used, things, you know, this, that's, this is an imperfect world, you know, there, there are tensions can run uh, high. Um, when, when unfortunate things happen and maybe things don't go perfectly, perfectly is, is it frustrating to you in the audience that uh, the communicators that typically are brought on most uh, uh, news networks tend to inflame the situation instead <laughs> of uh, diffuse it? Absolutely not. Would, uh, that never happens. No, we, have, uh, we love incendiary uh, news media. How many of y'all would prefer to see somebody like Drawn and Ryan brought onto television to actually commentate <laughs> on these kinds of issues? Thank you. Amen. This is pretty reasonable stuff, isn't it? Right. Can you tell that this, this is not built, uh, the, the, the thoughts and, and, uh, and communication here is not built uh, again, to, to wedge and, dis, and divide us more, it's actually to educate us and to bring us together as well as to make us uh, safer. So uh, in the last uh, you know, minute or two that we have here, uh, Jaron, give us any thoughts. Um, I mean, look, you know, as, as uh, let's also be honest, you know, there are certain uh, elements of our society that, that um, benefit from a divided country. And uh, that, that's, those elements might start to, to uh, become uh, animated here, even in the next 12 months before we meet again for Faith and Freedom and Coalition's Road to Majority. Thoughts that you have and, and counsel that you have for us uh, as we're living, consuming news, uh, you know, how can we be um, educators and um, bringing insight and not uh, further kind of incendiary uh, you know, uh, consumers here? Well, I think this is the um, perfect venue for us to kind of focus on the, the one entity that brought us all here together, and that's God. You know, get our strengthening from God, use the power of the Holy Spirit to be brave enough to kind of go out into society and be the peacemaker. You know, um, that's, that's, that's our duty of service. I wrote a book called Underserve. Um, it talks about those principles. Uh, a key part of underserved communities is dealing with community violence, um, bringing the police and community together. So go to underservedbook.com. It's a playbook on how we can get involved um, and bring these issues together to help underserved communities. Um, and then also to learn more about the work that we're doing around violent crime, go to endviolentcrime.com. Um, the only way that we can make these things happen is for us all to work together. It's me, it's you, it's Ryan, and it's the people. Um, let's make America the land of opportunity again. Yeah. So Ryan, close this out real quick. Uh, a, a bridge builder instead of a divider. Tell us your, uh, some, uh, you've got some really interesting thoughts and I think you, you may even have a, a, a resource for us as we, uh, as we head out. Yeah, absolutely. So it's very simple. And it kind of goes back to like Jerron said. It's three biblical principles that I actually spoke about and I wrote about in a book called Happy Eyes, Becoming All Things to All People. You see, the Apostle Paul was very, very good at what he did. He was all things to all people so that he might win one person. And he was able to do that by leading with three things, leading with love, leading with empathy, and leading with respect. If we can learn to lead with love a little bit, just love your neighbor as yourself, then you'll start to break those barriers a little bit and move forward closer to your neighbor. If you learn how to empathize with that person, don't have to com compromise who you are, don't have to conform to who you are, or to who they are, but if you learn to empathize, it's gonna actually allow you to see things a little bit more clearly and the last thing is just respect each other. You, one of the, the biggest reasons why we have, yep. thank you. One of the biggest reasons why we have the issues on the street we have is all in the name of respect. So lead with love, lead with empathy, lead with respect, and we can bridge that gap. And you guys can uh, find my uh, website, breakingbarriersunite.com, and we'll be launching our book, Happy Eyes, Becoming All Things to All People in two weeks. Thank you guys. Thank you so much for being with us today and for all the work that you're doing to keep us safe and to bring us together. Amen. Thanks guys. Thanks so thank much. You.
always go back to the book of Joshua. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for God will be with you wherever you go. Believing once again in America is the only way to defend ourselves from those who want to destroy us. Nikki Haley. Nikki Haley. Nikki Haley, the former U.S. ambassador to the U.N., of course, former South Carolina governor, and much, much more. The nature of the North Korean regime is it's hard to find a terrorist down. group in the Middle East that does not have Iran's fingerprints. State. Governor Nikki Haley announced Michelin is spending $200 million. I'm going to introduce tax reform to show them how we can get it done. We are not okay with abortion up until the time of birth. 90% of American kids are still under critical race theory. We're pushing what a small minority want on the majority of Americans. It's too much. same America I see and stand for America together with me. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Faith and Freedom Coalition Director of Marketing and Events, Joy Creaseman. Great. Well, I have the honor and privilege of introducing our next great speaker, who served as the 116th governor of the great state of South Carolina. While governor, her state was an economic leader, with her unemployment rate being at a 15-year low, and new jobs were being added in every county of the state. And she was one of the most pro-life governors in America. She went on to serve as the 29th United States Ambassador to the United Nations, where she stood up for Israel, and she strongly supported the moving of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. Please help me welcome our great next speaker, Ambassador Nikki Haley. so much. It's great to be with all of you. I love you too. We know that when two or more are gathered in his name, God is with us. And so it is a great day for us all to be together. You know, I want to tell you a little bit about myself for those of you who don't know. And then I want to talk about where we are in the country. I was born and raised in a small rural town in South Carolina, two stoplights, 2,500 people. You couldn't think about doing something wrong without somebody already telling your mom. We were the only Indian family in that small southern town. We weren't white enough to be white. We weren't black enough to be black. They didn't know who we were, what we were, or why we were there. And I remember when I would get teased on the playground, my mom would always say, your job is not to show them how you're different. Your job is to show them how you're similar. It's amazing how the country could use my mom's advice today. And even though they didn't know why we were there, my parents knew why we were there. Because there was never a day they didn't remind me, my brothers, and my sister how blessed we were to live in America. My mom started a business out of the living room of our home. 30 plus years later, it was a successful company. I started doing the books for them when I was 13. It wasn't until I got to college that I realized that was child labor. I went on to Clemson. I graduated with a degree in accounting. I'm an accountant, not a lawyer. Accountants are problem solvers. And then, and then I went on and worked in the corporate world. You know, when I became governor, we took on South Carolina when she was hurting. We had put all our jobs in textiles, and when textiles went overseas, so did the jobs. South Carolina had 11% unemployment. We had thousands of people on welfare, and we needed to get to work. So I quickly got to work. By the time I left, 
South Carolina was an economic powerhouse. We were building planes with Boeing. We were building more BMWs than any place in the world. We brought in Mercedes-Benz. We brought in Volvo. We had five international tire companies, and they were referring to us as the beast of the Southeast, which I love. We moved 35,000 people from welfare to work, and we put reforms in our prison systems that now have us with the lowest recidivism rate in the country in South Carolina. We were named the friendliest state in the country, the most patriotic state in the country, and the number two state in the country people were moving to. And then I got the call to go to the United Nations. And my response was, I don't even know what the UN does. I just know everybody hates it. I was right. But when I got to the UN, I wanted countries to know what America was for and what America was against. I didn't care if they didn't like me, but I wanted them to respect America. So we got to work. We pulled ourselves out of the Iran deal. We acknowledged a truth. We acknowledged a truth and moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And we passed the largest set of sanctions against a country in a generation with North Korea. But the, but the most important thing that we did, we took the kick me sign off of our backs and America was respected again. Now I'm running for president and I don't need to tell you how bad things are. You don't have to turn on the news to see it. We are $32 trillion in debt. We're having to borrow money just to make our interest payments. Now, I would love to say to you that Biden did that to us, but I have always spoken in hard truths, and I'm going to do that with you today. Our Republicans did that to us, too. You go back and you look at that $2.2 trillion COVID stimulus bill that they passed with no accountability whatsoever expanded welfare that leaves us now with 90 million Americans on Medicaid, 42 million Americans on food stamps. And did Republicans try and make it right? No, they opened up earmarks for the first time in 10 years, pushing through 7,000 of them in December, and just recently, $10 billion Republicans pushed through, $9 billion Democrats pushed through. Wanna know how they spent your money? Seven and a half million on horse racing in Arizona. 30 million on an honors college in Vermont. 10 million to tear down a hotel in Alaska. Seven and a half million on a courthouse in Colorado. All while one in six American families can't pay their, credit, can't pay their utility bill, 60% of Americans are in credit card debt. Social Security will go bankrupt in 10 years. Medicare will go bankrupt in eight. Bless you. Then you look at the education system that we have. Everybody wants to blame COVID for education. No, we had problems with education before COVID. Pre-COVID, 67% of eighth graders in our country were not proficient in reading or math. Think about that. Recently, two weeks ago, 82% of eighth graders weren't proficient in history or civics. Now you put two years of lockdowns on them and our kids are in a world of hurt, yet you still have too many kids going through with critical race theory, which if a little girl goes into kindergarten, if she's white, you're telling her she's bad. If she's brown or black, you're telling her she'll never be good enough and she'll always be a victim. You've got biological boys playing in women's sports. This is one of the biggest issues of our time and no one is doing anything about it. My daughter ran track in high school. I don't even know how I would have that conversation with her. How do we get our girls used to biological boys in their locker room? You can't. And then Johns Hopkins comes out with the definition of a woman. Do you see what it was? A non-man. You cannot erase women. We can't stop how far we have come.
We have to fight for our girls and make sure that they know that we have their back. And yet they want to know why a third of our teenage girls last year seriously contemplated suicide. We need to be raising strong girls. Strong girls become strong women. Strong women become strong leaders. Then you look at the border, and let me tell you, I've been to the border, and I didn't pull a Kamala and go and come back. I went 400 miles down that border. You're not ready for what I saw. Mounds of clothes, mounds of shoes, paraphernalia, areas of rape centers that women and girls have to walk through. When ranchers get up in the morning, they get their coffee, and they go see if anyone died trying to cross their fence. They pick up whatever little kids were left behind and turn them over to Border Patrol. I met with multiple sheriffs. They said before 7 a.m., they round up whatever illegal immigrants they can find, turn them over to Border Patrol. Border Patrol documents them and releases them until their court date years from now. And when you ask Border Patrol about their job, they said, you want to know what we do? We're glorified babysitters. They don't let us do our job. Five million illegal immigrants. We had enough fentanyl cross the border that would kill every single American last year. Number one cause of death of adults 18 to 49, fentanyl. And don't think for a second China doesn't know exactly what they're doing when they send it over. Then you look at our national security situation. Did you ever think we'd look at the sky and see a Chinese spy balloon looking right back at us? It's a national embarrassment. You've got Russia on the march in Ukraine trying to take their freedom. You've got North Korea testing ballistic missiles. You've got Iran building a bomb. You've got China on the march. But make no mistake, none of this would have happened had we not had that debacle in Afghanistan. My husband is a combat veteran. He deployed to Afghanistan. The idea that he and his military brothers and sisters had to watch the U.S. leave Bagram Air Force Base in the middle of the night without telling our allies who stood shoulder to shoulder with us for decades because we asked them to be there. Think about what that told our friends. More importantly, think about what that told our enemies. We've got some serious work to do. So that's a lot of bad, right? It's hard to find anything good. But now I'm going to tell you what I told South Carolinians when I became governor. No more whining. No more complaining. Now we get to work. How do we fix it? When it comes to our economy, we claw back the $500 billion of unspent COVID dollars that are out there. In, instead of 87,000 IRS agents going after middle America, we go after the hundreds of billions of dollars of COVID fraud that we know exist. If 8% of our budget is interest, quit borrowing. Cut up the credit cards. You have to balance a budget every day. I had to balance a budget as governor of South Carolina. Why is Congress the only group that doesn't have to balance a budget? Let's change that. I will stop the spending. I will stop the borrowing. I will stop the earmarks. And I will veto any spending bill that doesn't take us back to pre-COVID levels. When it comes to education in South Carolina, we knew if a child couldn't read by third grade, they were four times less likely to graduate high school. So we started holding them back. We put them in reading remediation programs. We brought in their parents and we set them up for success. We need to do that across this country to get our kids back on track. And no parent should ever have to wonder what is being said or taught to their child in the classroom. We need to always have parental rights in this country. We have one job, one job, and no school bureaucrat can take that away from us. And we need to make sure that parents can decide which schools their kids go to. 
No child should be mandated by where they were born and raised. And then let's build things in America again. Let's put vocational classes back in the high schools. As governor of South Carolina, we had apprenticeships all over our state. Our kids were learning how to build what we were making. And then when it comes to our universities, we'll tell universities, you either take American money or Chinese money, but the days of taking both are over. We'll get that Chinese infiltration out of our universities. And you know, I want to talk to you about the issue of life. As governor, I fought for life and passed pain-capable legislation and multiple things we did to support mothers. At the UN, we did everything we could to stop abortions across our world. Now we're in a situation where we're having a big debate over life and abortion. But I think it's time that we look at this and deal with it the right way. I am unapologetically pro-life. I'm not pro-life because the Republican Party tells me to be. I'm pro-life because my husband was adopted. I had trouble having both of my children. I am surrounded by blessings. But we need to make sure that our country stops demonizing this issue and we humanize this issue. This is personal for everyone, every woman and every man in America. Let's go back to how this happened because we have to start telling the American people the truth. Pre-1973, you had 46 state laws on abortion. And then all of a sudden, unelected justices came out in 1973, threw out those 46 state laws and said abortion anytime, anywhere, for any reason. Now a wrong has been made right. And we've taken it back away from the unelected justices, and we've put it back in the hands of the states. Now, some of the states have become more pro-life, and I welcome that. Some have become more on the abortion side. I wish that wasn't the case. But now there's the issue of, is there a place for a federal law? I think there is. But in order, but in order for us to have a federal law, let's be honest. It takes the majority of a House, it takes 60, 6 zero Senate votes, and a signature of a president. We haven't had 60 Senate votes in over 100 years. We might have 45 pro-life senators. So let's start talking about how we can come together on what we can agree on. I think we can do federal legislation that the American people will agree, let's stop late-term abortions. Let's focus on encouraging more adoptions and making sure that we have kids with more love and foster care than not. Let's protect religious liberty, and if there are doctors and nurses who don't believe in abortion, they shouldn't have to perform them. And let's make sure no state laws say that if a woman has an abortion, she's not going to go to jail and we're not going to give her the death penalty. Let's start there because that's what I think we can get done. We have to humanize this situation. We have to respect the fact that everybody has a story and we have one goal, to make sure we save as many babies as possible and protect as many mothers as possible. That's our goal. That's what I will do for you. Now, when it comes to the border, how do we fix the border? You know, when I was governor, I passed one of the toughest illegal immigration laws in the country. We did a mandatory E-Verify, and we said that every business had to prove whoever they hired were here in this country legally. We will do a national E-Verify program. We will defund sanctuary cities once and for all. Instead of 87,000 IRS agents, we'll put 25,000 Border Patrol and ICE agents on the ground and let them do their job. We will go back to remain in Mexico because guess what? Nobody wants to remain in Mexico. And we will stop catch and release and we will go to catch and deport. We will stop all of this lawlessness happening on the border. And when it comes to our national security, 
We will let countries know what we expect of them. No more being reactionary. You know, when I was at the UN, there were two things that our enemies never wanted us to have. They never wanted us to have a strong military, and they never wanted us to be energy independent. We will do both of those things. Strong militaries don't start wars. Strong militaries prevent wars. And with energy, we will do an all of the above approach. No more going hat in hand to Saudi Arabia and no more getting dirty oil from Iran and Venezuela. And then we will make sure that we're smart. You know, when we moved that embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem and we were condemned by the entire world, I went to my office and I said, I want you to put a book together. I want you to list all 193 countries that belong to the UN. I want the second column to be the percentage of times they vote with the U.S. and against the U.S. And I want the third column to be how much foreign aid we give them. I took that book and I gave it to President Trump. He lost his mind. He's flipping pages. He's yelling out countries. And I said, look, I'm not saying you give foreign aid based on a percentage vote. But that should be one of the things we look at. Quit trying to buy friends. Quit trying to pay off enemies. They gave $50 billion in foreign aid last year. Do you know who they gave it to? Pakistan, that harbored terrorists that tried to kill our soldiers. Iraq, that has Iranian influence that says death to America. Zimbabwe, the most anti-American African country there is. Belarus, who's holding hands with Russia as they invade Ukraine. We give money to communist Cuba, who we named a state sponsor of terrorism and who now has a spy center on us with China. And the one that's the biggest kick in the gut, we give money to China. How weak do we look? When I am president, we will no longer give money to countries that hate America. So we have the answers. We know what we need to do. But the thing that bothers me the most is this national self-loathing that has taken over our country. The idea that they say America's bad or rotten or racist. I was elected the first female minority governor in history. America's not racist, we're blessed. Our kids need to know to love America. They need to be saying the Pledge of Allegiance when they start school every day. Do you remember when you were growing up? Do you remember how simple life was? Do you remember how safe you felt? It was about faith, family, and country. Your parents raised you to be a responsible individual. You went to school and you learned what you needed to to be successful. You went to church and you found your faith and your conscience. Don't you want that again? Because we could have that again. But in order to do that, we have to have a new generational leader. We've got to leave the negativity and the drama and the chaos of the past. We have to make sure that we're looking forward and we're looking towards solutions. You know, three days ago, I dropped my husband off at 4 a.m to go on another year-long deployment. And when I did, I watched him and 230 other soldiers hold two duffel bags to load a bus to go to a country they've never been. And they were all doing it in the name of protecting and defending America. They don't care about this political drama back and forth. 
They care about protecting our freedoms. They still believe in this country. We need to make sure that if they're willing to go fight to defend us, then when we're here in this country and we're looking at this next presidential, we need to fight to defend and protect them. We've got a country to save. But in order to save her, we're going to have to have a lot of courage. Courage for me to run and courage for every one of you to know, don't complain about what you get in a general election if you don't play in this primary. It matters. Someone asked me why I was running. And I said, my parents came here 50 years ago to an America that was strong and proud and full of opportunities. I want them to know that country again. I'm doing this for my husband and his military brothers and sisters because they need to know their sacrifice means something. They need to know that we love our country. I'm doing this for my daughter who just got married and I saw how hard it was for her and her husband to buy a home. And I'm doing this for my son who's gonna be a senior in college and I have watched him write papers of things he doesn't believe in just to get an A. That's not our country, that's not us. And recently 78% of Americans have said they don't think their kids are gonna have as good of a life as they did. We can't be okay with that. I'm not okay with that. We do have a country to save. But I'm telling you, if we have faith in God, if we remember that America has an amazing ability to self-correct, if we all commit today, and if you will join me, I promise you our best days are to come. God bless you. I appreciate you very much. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. When she was an American girl. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president of Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life America, Marjorie Dannon Felser. I am not, uh, I, I am not Marjorie Dannon Felser. However, I just want to take a minute and tell you, uh, we've been friends for longer than I'm going to say. Let's don't say. I helped recruit her at a college Republican table many years ago. <laughs> She's one of the leading pro-life figures in America today. We partner with them all over the country. They are advocating a pain-capable bill at the federal level that we strongly support and are lobbying for. Please welcome my dear friend, Marjorie Dannon Felser. <laughs> If I had more time, I'd have some stories, but I don't, about Mr. Reed. Beautiful all. And I'm very grateful to you, Ralph Reed. Um, so I just came from the Lincoln Memorial, where we're celebrating with other pro-life organizations the overturn of Roe versus Wade in the Dobbs decision today. <laughs> this is the anniversary of that overturn. At 10.10 in the morning is when that decision came down. And let me, let me just tell you, I don't think that it's an accident that John 10.10 10 reads this. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So for 50 years, so many of you and so many all over the country in the most organic movement that we have in our modern times in a human rights movement have marched have begged, have cajoled, have lobbied, have sacrificed, have been on their knees and then back up on their knees and marching and marching, never giving up, especially when people said it was impossible because we know all things are possible through God. We've learned a lot in those 50 years. We've learned a lot in those 50 years and one thing that we've learned is about the development of the child in an intimate way, the way that we never knew before. 
We also have increased in faith, but we have lost 63 million children that we needed in this world. Each one made for a certain purpose that only he or she could fill. We feel their loss, and we feel the loss of their mothers who needed something different than an abortion, a pat on the back, and bring your problems back home with you. So here we are. We are at the starting line. We have just begun. We have just begun a journey to start saving lives. 25 states have just passed laws that save lives around this country. 60,000 children saved so far around. 60,000 moms getting help they need to get out of cycles of poverty, out of cycles of, of abusive relationships, help, help and support from their communities in ways that the abortion lobby would never even dream of. This starting line means that 25 states, 24 states is a pretty outstanding beginning for one year, but that leaves half the country and more than half the abortions in this country still stealing our children and harming our women. And so what do we do? Well, the perfect thing is, is that we are in the middle of a presidential primary right now, and you are hearing from some of our best and brightest. Some of the things we're hearing, I take objection to. I do not think that we're done. I think we've just begun. And those children who live in California and New York have human rights equal to those in every other state. Human rights is not dependent on geography. Where you live should not determine whether you live. And so a president has a strong moral obligation to advance the strongest that he or she can. And we must not assume there is no consensus because there is, there is consensus at least 15 weeks, perhaps before, but at least there at 15 weeks when a child can feel pain. That's a 70% issue versus a 15 at best issue on the other side. I say let's stand with the crowd at least to begin on the federal level and don't wait for others to gather your consensus. You, know, you did not hear when Ronald Reagan stood at that Berlin Wall, he didn't say I came here to wait. I came here to wait until you guys build consensus in the world to tear down this wall. No, he said, Mr. G, tear down this wall. So how about, I just wanna congratulate you and thank you for the part that you have played in getting to this starting point. And the beautiful uh, pro-life movement is not just gonna be a pro-life movement, it's gonna be America's movement for our own world and for the rest of the world so we no longer export abortion to solve our problems in the rest of the world. And of course, we're in the best place we could possibly be in this country because we are, are a country that is ruled by ideals, by principles, right, liberty, happiness, right to life, liberty, and ha happiness. We're not ruled by kings or despots. And yet the left would have you accept an abortion policy like China's. We have an abortion China policy in this nation up until the end up until the end, and we all pay for it. The beautiful is to welcome everyone into the human family, serve those moms in ways that they deserve, welcome those children, and, ex and protect them in the law. Yes, in every state where all those victories are occurring, but I invite you to join with me, in addition to what you're already doing, to build that mandate to protect those children uh, and advance a presidency and a Congress that will not worry about 60 votes, but will build a majority opinion and insist that it occur to save those lives. And I thank you so much for listening and God bless you and God bless America. Well, we didn't really plan it this way, but we ended, we're ending the morning session with three amazing strong women. We just had Nikki Haley, we just had Marjorie Dannenfelser, and now we're getting ready to have one of my personal favorites, one of your personal favorites, Judge Jeanine Perot. <laughs> Do we love her or what? She's a former prosecutor, and by the way, a brilliant woman, former county judge who won a daytime Emmy for her syndicated show, Judge Perot. For years, she hosted 
the number one weekend show on cable television. And I used to love her opening statement. And now she's a regular and a co-host on the number one show on all of cable television, The Five, which my wife DVRs every single day and which we watch every night. She has a new book out called Crimes Against America, and she's going to be doing a book signing immediately after this speech. Would you please welcome one of the most capable conservative voices in the country today, an amazing woman and a great friend of faith and freedom, Judge Janine Perot. a break after me. So I understand the meaning of that. So I will be, I will be relatively brief. Listen, I'm also uh, always want to thank uh, Ralph Reed, and I want to thank Jason Williams, and I want to thank Joy Creaseman for the work that they do putting this together. It is an enormous conference. I mean, how many places, how many conferences can you go to and get the category of speakers that you've had at this Faith and Freedom con uh, conference? Which, by the way, the road to the majority says it all. So uh, I am glad to be a part of it. And for the next few minutes, I'm going to give you a break from politics. And I want to talk to you about truth and justice. Not that the two are necessarily mutually exclusive, but maybe they are. Uh, maybe they are the way America is running today. But you know, Rome and America were not built in a day. Rome took, in fact, a long time to fall. America, on the other hand, unfortunately, is at a point of being lost in a single generation. Assuming that there are historians in the future who report honestly, they will look at our country during this time that we are living in and ask, how did she hit rock bottom so quickly? What happened to her values, those Judeo-Christian values? And what happened to truth and justice in America? How did America choose leaders like the Clintons and Obama and, and Joe Biden, who were draining the life out of a once exceptional nation, turning it into a socialist, anti-Christian, anti-police place. Now, I've been a prosecutor, a judge, and a DA for over three decades. Most of you know that. I've run for office five times. And I have spent my life in the trenches fighting good and evil where that unfolds every day. But every day in this country, someone becomes a victim of a crime. They didn't do anything, they didn't ask for it, and all of a sudden, like a thunderbolt, a criminal chooses to victimize them. I see the ugliest side of life and the pain people go through for no reason. I've seen children who go to sleep in their own beds to become victims of unspeakable torture and abuse. Women murdered by the very men, men who say they love them. But I want you to think of crime in a different way today for the next few minutes. What if your entire country became a crime scene? What if your entire country were the victim of a crime? Welcome to America 2023. We all grew up in the America that Ronald Reagan talked about, that shining city on the hill, the richest, the most educated, the most powerful military. People were healthy. Education was stellar. The cities were world-class industrial hubs, not just for industry, but for art and culture. But today, our natural and national unity has been compromised, and we have suffered assaults to our bedrock principles. 
to a capitalist market-based economy that is trashed as inappropriate, the principles of freedom of religion and freedom of speech as not being necessary and not respected, are world-class schools now spread indoctrination, and many of the seniors who are graduating can't even read or do math. And at the top of all of this is a visceral symbol of our national decline, if ever there were one, Joe Biden. Never, never in the history of this country has one president done so much to damage a country in so little time. And at times his actions have been so destructive that they are indistinguishable from what a foreign saboteur would do. He has thrown away America's energy independence and he's put us on our knees to our enemies, to Iran, to China. He has taken away the incentive to work and he has replaced it with a more socialist system where rewards are, 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 are given out based upon your sex, your orientation, your skin, having nothing to do with your ability. How do we even get these people into office? Freedom of speech was suppressed, and that's how Joe Biden got into office. They suppressed our ability to talk to each other about a laptop that was a treasure trove of information for prosecutors, of information of an organized criminal enterprise that is at the top of our federal government. The assault was coordinated. It was coordinated. I'm sorry, I don't have my own microphone. I should have asked for that. It was coordinated by the mainstream media, by big tech, and by the Department of Justice, FBI, and the Central Intelligence Agency. We know that based on those people who knew nothing about Hunter Biden's laptop, that the election might have been different based upon the number of people who would have voted differently had they been able to have access to that information. These so-called progressives are rolling us back. I love you. Thank you. Oh, I can't stand at a podium. It makes me crazy. These so-called progressives are rolling us back to medieval times to the age of Marxism and socialism, which is not what we need to survive in this country. And this does not happen by accident. This happens by plan. It happens by design. It's a product of a series of crimes that have been committed against each and every one of you and have been committed against America as a nation. There are moral crimes. There are physical crimes of assaults on our national resources sold to our enemies, assaults on the jobs of Americans who can no longer work in the coal industry, but instead we're supporting an industry in China where they're increasing the production of coal-powered plants so they can create lithium for our electric vehicles, which nobody I know wants. And let me tell you, it is a true crime story, and nobody knows better than I do. But unlike the regular criminals that I dealt with in the trenches for 30 years, they do it in front of our face. They don't hide it. If you don't like it, you better be quiet. You keep your mouth shut. You're a racist. You're, 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 you're just a phobe of some sort. It doesn't matter, you're a xenophobe, whatever they want to call you. And the mystery, though, happens in the cover-up. But unfortunately for them, we know about the cover-up. They can do everything they can to tell us that a laptop of Hunter Biden's that talks about a 10% commission to the big guy that we can now connect 
with the fact that this guy by the name of Walker set up shell corporations, which got $10 million in it, that went to nine different Bidens, the wife, the ex-wife, the ex-lover, the lover, the daughter. I mean, why? Because they couldn't put the money in one account. This is money laundering. That's how they do it. It's money laundering. And Rob Walker admitted it. He told it to the whistleblower. And then you got Bobolinsky. Here's a guy who's a retired Navy veteran, lieutenant. This guy is a nuclear engineer. He tells us Joe Biden met with the Chinese at that CEFC company. And so does Walker. Walker tells us the same thing. But Joe Biden lies to you. I don't know anything about my son's business. And the first question you ask is why would someone lie about that? Because it's consciousness of guilt. They have something to cover up. And that's what we've seen. And they distract you with noise about Russia and racism. Shame on them and shame on us if any of us bought it. And we fought. We fought with each other. Donald Trump is a Putin puppet. He's a Russian asset. That's nonsense. And we find out from Durham. Durham report comes out. Does the mainstream media report on it? Absolutely not. We find out from Durham. Hillary made up the Russian hoax. She told Obama and Biden about it. She told them she was going to do it. She paid for the dossier with campaign money. She didn't get prosecuted for that, but I don't have time to get into that. I just want you to know that there is one woman who split this country apart, and it was Hillary Clinton. She had us fighting with each other, family members fighting with each other, telling him, yes, he is, no, he isn't, yes, he is, no, he isn't. And finally, that sack of Schiff, Adam Schiff, he finally got censored. And I'm tired of all of them. You know why? They don't care about you and they don't care about me. They go about and commit their crimes and they are happy to ignore you. And the biggest problem, the biggest problem that we have today in America, the America that I grew up in that was so beautiful, is that we've lost our sovereignty. We are no longer a country with borders. We are not a sovereign nation. We are literally a global landing spot with benefits for anyone who demands entry into this country. If you want to come here, you're entitled to come here, get whatever you want, and we're not entitled to even know who you are. And they don't fingerprint them, DNA them, even the kids they don't DNA. And even a federal judge says, you can't let these people out into the interior of the United States unless and until you give them an alien registration number. They were just letting them out, just putting them in. And then they want to complain that the Republican governors, oh, they're sending them, they're racist, they're this and that, it's nonsense. And then, and then they tell us the police, the police are serial racist murderers. That is such a lie, but you see it's part of the plan. In order to have chaos and anarchy, you must defund the police. And the government is no longer providing the first order of government, which is the protection of its citizens. And then when we have someone who steps up because the police aren't there because it takes too long for 911 to get there, and somebody like a Marine veteran, a 24-year-old, steps in to fill in the vacuum, Danny Penny, they charge him with homicide. Shame on them. And they silence us, and they shut us down, and they call it misinformation, and they make up garbage about COVID, and they call us the deniers, and they have a ministry of truth. Truth and justice, are you kidding? There have been 300 med articles in medical journals since COVID that deny everything they were talking about. Shame on them. And what did COVID tell you? It described for you their intense affinity, affection, 
for that totalitarian instinct to step on you, to shut you down, to keep you in your house, to not let you go out, to not let you go to church. It shut down churches, small businesses, but it allowed strip clubs and liquor stores as essential businesses. That's not the America that the founding fathers wanted for this country. And I'll give you another one. And I, I, I'm going to be good. Don't worry, I'm not going to take that long. I'll give you another one that, that infuriates me. The Calvary Church in Las Vegas, during COVID, they wouldn't let more than 50 parishioners in the church. They appeal, they appeal, they appeal. They go up to the Supreme Court. And I think in Mika's jury, I'm not quite sure how it actually happened, but the, the multiplex cinema, uh, theaters and the, the uh, casinos joined in the, uh, in the appeal to the Supreme Court. Our United States Supreme Court comes down and they say, if the casinos want to open, have at it. It's a game of chance. Go for it. If you want to go to the 18th Theater Multiplex, have at it. Good for you. But the Calvary Church, only 50 of you can go in the church at one time. That is the United States Supreme Court, and I am damn ashamed of that decision. And on an international scale, the additional crimes against America. We have a Chinese spy craft that we knew about. Don't let anybody tell you they didn't know about it, okay? I mean, you can believe they're stupid, and I agree with that, but there's another piece to it. They hovered over America, and then uh, uh, the Aleutian Islands, and then came down and hovered over the intercontinental ballistic missile sites. Two people in Montana called up, they said, gee, what is that? And then we wait for it to get all the information it needs and then we blow it up, okay? Joe Biden is at a fundraiser. This guy actually says, we embarrass them, and Xi Jinping is really mad because we embarrass them by taking it down. Are you stupid? <laughs> China has nine police stations in this country, nine that are connected to Beijing, that they keep their eyes on Chinese nationals in this country. And they now, are connected to Cuba 90 miles from here. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but Hunter Biden, you know, poor Hunter, you know, he's, he's a drug addict, he's disturbed, he's got all these problems, but I got to tell you, you have to give Hunter credit. There aren't that many degenerate, sex-addicted drug addicts in the world who can cook crack, smoke crack, perform lewd sex acts, and film the whole thing on the phone at the same time. That takes real talent. It's worth all those millions. All right. My life, as I started for more than three decades, was fighting for and defending the innocent victims of crime the silent victims, the ones who suffer quietly through agonizing trauma. Now it's a different fight. Now it's time to fight for a different victim of crime, America. Because America is worth it. It's time to stand up for America. It's time to stand up for the bedrock principles enunciated in the Declaration of Independence of Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. It is time for us to defend this country because we can't let them get away with it. And I'm not going to let them get away with it. I wrote a book called Crimes Against America because I'm so fed up with their crimes. Are you going to let them get away with it? Are you going to let them take down the republic of the greatest nation on earth? Are you going to let him take God out of America? No. Are you going to let him take in God we trust out of my courtroom? No. Are you going to let him sexualize your children? No. Indoctrinate your children to make them think that they're oppressors. It's time to call them out, identify them, prosecute them, and get rid of them. 
It's time to stop the takedown of our republic, to send the liberal, socialist, condescending, arrogant, dictatorial, totalitarian leftists back where they came from, back to the history books of irrelevance, so that the America of Ronald Reagan, the shining city on the hill, can come back to America. God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the executive director of the Faith and Freedom Coalition, Timothy Head. All right, I got a couple of very quick but very important things. So as you're filing out, I want you to listen fast, okay? From 2 to 3.30, we actually are making room changes so as you probably have gathered, uh, the uh, security is starting to tighten, and they're going to, uh, so we've actually had to move from the uh, breakout sessions from down here to just upstairs. Uh, so the, the two breakout sessions that we have uh, from 2 to 3.30, we got a little uh, kind of pre-taste on the seven mountains of, influ of influence with Maggie. Did y'all enjoy the, the uh, stage uh, panel that we had there? Well, she's doing... She's kind of expanding on that a little for, from 2 to 3.30. That's going to be in Columbia, 9 and 10. So at the escalators, getting right at the, the, uh, the top of these escalators here, Columbia, 9 and 10. And then just right next to it in, in another little portion of that, that room up there is the other breakout room that we're doing. Uh, that one is uh, Hispanics re Reshaping the Americas. And uh, Nielsen's going to be leading a panel there from 2 to 3.30. That's Columbia, 11 and 12. So the bottom line is, if you'll just go into the Columbia room from 2 to 3.30, both of them are going to be in different parts of that large room, and you'll be able to find it, okay? Uh, and then secondly, and this is also very important, just bear in mind, uh, so because of the security needs for tonight, um, one, we got to fit a lot of people in here quickly, and then two, everybody also uh, obviously is going to have to go through mags. Uh, so we're actually going to start, the goal is to have everything swept uh, and uh, everybody uh, up in the, that uh, terrace level that, we, that we've been kind of coming down, uh, be ready at 5 o'clock. Lines will start to, to come in through the mags at 5 o'clock so that we can actually be in place uh, shortly after 6 and, and start to get, uh, get going on dinner at least close to on time, all right? Uh, so uh, we actually have one last but very full uh, evening together. And uh, something tells me this, uh, this is not going to probably run exactly according to uh, schedule tonight, but uh, that's probably okay with most of us, right? As long as we get our food, right? At least was... So, uh, and, and uh, you know, I just want to thank you all so much for being with us this morning. Y'all did a great job coming in early, staying late. We love it. Appreciate it so much. Um, grab a quick bite if you want to, and we'll, uh, we'll see you in breakouts from 2 to 3.30 in Columbia and see you uh, at the entrance to the mags at five o'clock. Thanks, see you soon.